Board of Alders Notice New Haven. The Joint Community Development slash Legislation Committee of the Board of Alders will meet on Wednesday, October 27th, 2021 at 6 o'clock p.m. via video conference at https colon slash slash bit.ly slash 2y6sd0p and by phone at 646-558-8656, webinar ID 982-9167-2229. To hear and act on the following item, for a required password, contact public testimony at newhavenct.gov. 1. LM-2021-0377, Zoning Amendment to Modify Plan Development District Number 53 and Coastal Site Plan Review to allow for residential use up to 500 apartments located at 501 uh, to 585 Long Wharf Drive, including MBLU numbers 205-0529-00202, 205-0529-00102-080-0530-0101, and 205-0529-00300. Per order, Honorable Charles Decker, co-chair, and Honorable Ryan Wingate, co-chair. Attest, Honorable Michael Smart, city clerk. These items are on file and available at the office of the city clerk, room 202 at 200 Orange Street, New Haven, Connecticut, 06510. Since this meeting will be held Using solely electronic equipment, participation by a quorum of members at the same physical location is prohibited unless that location is made open to the public. Any member of the public may request in writing a physical location and any electronic equipment necessary to attend the meeting in real time no later than 24 hours prior to the meeting. Said person shall have the same opportunities to provide comment or otherwise participate in the meeting as would be afforded if the meeting were held in person, with the following exception. Under law, the commission is not required to adjourn or postpone the meeting if any person loses the ability to participate because of an interruption, failure, or degradation of any person's connection to the meeting by electronic equipment. For accommodations to view the meeting, please email public testimony at newhavenct.gov or call 203-946-6483. For accessibility related accommodations, please call 203-946-7651 voice or 203-946-8582 TTY TDD. Public comment and testimony may also be submitted via email to public testimony at newhavenct.gov before two o'clock p.m. on the day of the meeting. If you wish to present testimony at the meeting, you must register in advance at https colon slash slash bit.ly slash 2y6sd0p or by calling 203-946-7934 or emailing public testimony at newhavenct.gov before two o'clock p.m. on the day of the meeting for the required password. Public can view the meeting at https colon slash slash bit.ly slash 2y6sd0p or listen by phone at 646-558-8656. Webinar ID 982-9167-2229. The password to listen by phone only is 464-33170. Uh, There's a second page, but it's blank. That is the notice. Welcome, colleagues. Um, so this is a joint meeting of the legislation and community development um, committees. And so um, the way we're going to proceed this evening is I'm going to introduce the committee. Um, I will introduce first my co-chair and vice chairs. Then I'm going to call the roll of this joint committee alphabetically because I don't know which committee I should have listed first or second. Um, I love both these committees exactly equally. Um, then we will have the items, uh, the makers of the items come present. Colleagues can ask any questions. Um, I'll remind you when it's that time, but you can raise your hand either uh, with the little hand icon or just on screen um, for a question. And if and when it becomes time to make motions or, uh, or vote on motions, um, I will again call the roll um, for voting alphabetically. Um, so good evening colleagues. Um, I will now call the roll of this joint committee. Um, Charles Decker, chair of legislation is here. Um, do we have co-chair Brian Wingate of community development yet? Brian will and not be with us. Brian will not be with us. Yeah, no, I don't think so. Okay. Uh, so I'm I'm standing in as co-chair for community development. My name is Frank Douglas. I'm the Alder for Ward 2. Thank you and uh, welcome, Co-Chair Douglas. Um, Vice Chair Furlow of Legislation. Good afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Richard Furlow, Ward 27. Welcome and thanks for being with us. Alder Brackeen from Legislation. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Darrell Brackeen, Ward 26, legislation. Welcome, Alder. Alder Kupo from Community Development. Will be with us shortly, I'm sure, because I was speaking with her earlier. Um, Alder DeCola from Community Development. Not yet. Alder Edwards from Community Development. Alder Kimberly Edwards, Ward 19. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Welcome, Alder. Alder Ferraro Santana from Legislation. Alder Rosa Ferraro Santana, Ward 13. Welcome, Alder. Alder Marchand from Legislation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Alder Adam Marshawn, Ward 7, uh, 25. Getting, getting, getting a little loopy here on a, on a Tuesday uh, evening. It is Tuesday, right? Yes, for it's Tuesday. Um, it's Wednesday, not even Tuesday. Alder uh, Marks from Community Development. Not yet. Alder Morrison from Legislation. And Alder Rodriguez from Community Development. Alder Carmen Rodriguez, Ward 6. Welcome, Alder Rodriguez. Um, I would also like to welcome our colleagues who are sitting in who aren't members of this committee. Um, I see Alder Roth, um, who is from Ward 7, um, unlike Alder Marchand. Um, I see Alder Campton Singh um, from the 5th Ward. I see Alder Ana Festa, my neighbor in the 10th Ward. Um, let me just take a quick look at the attendees. Um, I see Alder Koopa waiting to join us. Um, so she will be in shortly. Um, I will give her a chance to join us and introduce herself and then we'll get started. Hi, uh, Alder Ellen Koopa, Ward 8. Um, I have another text from Alder Wingate about trying to get in. Um, maybe Mr. Lucas can continue to work with, uh, with him if he is going to be joining us. Um, but as we uh, hopefully will be joined by others, um, let's go ahead and hear this item. So uh, Mr. Lucas, if you could call in the makers of the item before us this evening, which to remind folks is item number LM-2021-0377. Okay, give me one second. There's a few folk. Indeed. Um, if you wanna raise your hand, that will be helpful as well. All right, I see several folks have joined us. Um, so if you are going to speak and uh, contribute to this meeting and participate, um, before you do, I'm gonna need you to give us your name and your address for the record, please. Um, but there's, a, there's a, a whole fleet of you, so I'm, I'm not sure who's kicking us off. Uh, good evening, uh, Chairman Decker and uh, Acting Chairman Douglas and members of the committees. Uh, my name is Matt Rinelli. Uh, I live actually in Ward 10 on Willow Street, New Haven, and my office is in New Haven on Church Street. Um, I, I, uh, I am uh, the attorney for the maker of this uh, item, the, the applicant, um, uh, Fusco Maritime Center and Fusco Harbor Associates. Uh, and I have our team with us this evening. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if it's okay with you, um, I could have them introduce themselves as we appear. Is that okay? Works for me, thank you. Proceed. Okay. Great. Um, we are very happy and excited to be here and thank uh, the committees for the time uh, to bring and present uh, what we think is an exciting plan for Long Wharf and for the larger city of New Haven uh, to you this evening. What I'd, I'd like to do if possible is have um, 
one of my uh, colleagues, uh, if, if Mr. Lucas could authorize uh, Brian O'Connor to share his screen. We have some uh, slides to, to help with our presentation. And while that's happening, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, what I'd like to do, if it's okay, we have, you know, there's a lot uh, to discuss. Um, I will say this is a PDD modification. So it's a technically falls under the heading of a zoning modification that's before you. Uh, and it has with it uh, under the New Haven's regulations and, and the city coastal management, uh, the state coastal management act. It also has a coastal management review component to it. That's why there's two items. Um, and I think what we'd like to do, obviously the focus of this evening is on the zoning modification, like other zoning modifications uh, this, uh, these committees have handled in the past. It's really about amending the zone that already exists, PDD 53, uh, to specifically allow for uh, residential use. Um, and as all of you know, this, the PDD process later entails, uh, if, if, we, if we get the modification to the zone approved, we then would come back with a detailed site plan. So while we do have renderings and we do have a lot of information because we, for our own purposes, wanted to develop it, and also because some of that information is required as part of the application, we have that, but uh, strictly speaking, it's not um, a site plan review, it's more of a, uh, it's a zoning modification review. So with that in mind, um, we will present it to you, but there are, I wanna be mindful of the committee's time. So we will ask you at varying points if you want us to continue uh, into additional detail or if you, I'm not, uh, I'm not supporting this. I don't even know what this is. I'm not supporting it. I'm not supporting it. I, I, didn't, I didn't miss too much. Um, so I think we have Chair Wingate to join us. And thank, thank you for that clarification, attorney. And um, uh, colleagues, we will try to be, uh, to keep our questions germane to the item actually in front of us. Um, yeah. But we're proceed. happy to tell you. Well, actually, let me let, me let my co-chair introduce himself first, um, Alder Wingate. My apologies, I was having some technical difficulties trying to get into the meeting, but I'm Brian Wingate from Ward 29, um, Chair of Community Development. Um, I don't like to start my night off like this, so once again, I apologize. <laughs> Good evening, Alder Wingate, it's nice to talk to you again. I think we met uh, recently. Um, so uh, I was just explaining our, our presentation, but we haven't started, so let's jump right in. Um, if I could have the next slide. Um, so th uh, this is our team. Uh, you'll, uh, you'll hear in a minute from uh, the president of Fusco Development, Lynn Fusco. Uh, I will then walk you through the zoning modification. And then we have, uh, you know, to the extent you would like us to get into this level of detail, we do have our design professionals, our landscape architect, and our architect that can take you through the general plan. Uh, and then after that, we also have with us for either questions or presentation, uh, our subject matter experts in coastal resources, uh, stormwater management, and traffic. Um, so if I could have the next slide. Uh, these are our team members. Um, I won't introduce all of them. What I'll do is introduce the ones who are going to speak as we work our way through uh, the presentation. Um, so next slide, please. What I'd like to do first is, is introduce uh, Lynn Fusco, the president of Fusco Corporation, to give you a little bit of a uh, of sense of what motivate, motivated Fusco for this project and motivates them in general. Uh, they're obviously well known to most of you, most of the city, um, and they are, as you'll hear, headquartered down at the Maritime Center, a building that they built uh, in the mid 80s. And as you can see, still looks terrific and is maintained extremely well. So Lynn, would you, uh, I'd like to, um, if your microphone is on, why don't you go ahead and I think so. I think, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So good evening, uh, co-chairs and members of both committees. Please feel free to interrupt me uh, if I'm rambling or you have any questions. As Matt said, I'm the president of Fusco 
The company uh, was started by my grandfather, who was a stonemason. Oh, I'm sorry to cut you off, but can you also give us your address for the record? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, uh, my office is 555 Long Wharf Drive, New Haven, Hill South. Thank you. Proceed. Okay. So the company was founded by my grandfather. He was a stonemason. He went from Ellis Island to Worcester Square, like so many, when he was 16 years old. He started the company in New Haven, and we've been operating continuously uh, since then. So it's 97 years in New Haven. Um, some selected projects that I've chosen to show you of recent memory, of course, the Metropolitan Business Academy we built for the city of New Haven, um, the Amistad School on Dixwell, and then the Eli, White, Eli Whitney Technical School that we recently finished. Uh, my father went to troop school and we also renovated um, and added to troop school. There are several schools, but I didn't want to put them all out there. Two development projects I've chosen to put on there is the multi-panel glass building by Spiegel's um, that we continue to own and rent to Yale New Haven Hospital. That is a development project of Fusco's. And then, of course, where our headquarter is down, on, down in New Haven. This headquarters was built on the New Haven waterfront in 1985. And uh, except for the restaurant and the second building, uh, this, the land has laid fallow really for many years. And that is largely because of market reasons. But we believe that now with the residential market as ginned up as it is and the equity market, um, it's, it's time to build. <clears throat> We wanted always to do something more than just having an office park here. We wanted to have um, more parkland, more pu public gathering spots. We want some commercial activity, a marketplace, and of course, residential to create more of a, the expression is of a there there. And thus we bring this to you this evening uh, for consideration to create it more interesting. At my community, at the community team meeting, I was surprised to hear from Carmen and Sarah and others that they often feel that living in City Point and taking a walk in the evenings or on the weekends, they don't think there really is a place to go that is green enough, quiet enough, or attractive enough. They'll take the walk down, the famous walk down past the Vietnam Park and head toward us. But there really isn't any waterfront access that's been developed to um, invite the neighbors and residents in this neighborhood. It's, in, it's really become, you know, it's commercial largely in character. And so we believe that this would enhance that greatly. Um, <clears throat> I don't, I believe that, um, you know, with our history and I, we, we marked up a map here just to show you some of what we've done in the last 97 years, we are in the business of helping towns and cities help shape their future. That's what we do. We build, we develop, and we manage most of the properties that we own. This is a long list. I believe that we have the track record and it's largely reflected as Matt said in the way our properties are taken care of, that you would know that what we build, what we say we're gonna build, we pay taxes and have for many, many years. And we also take care of the properties that we've developed. Matt. You're on mute, Matt. Great, thank you, Lynn. With that, let me just jump right in to uh, our application. Uh, all of you should have received, uh, I think a physical copy and probably an electronic copy of the application materials will Everything we present is, is in these materials, largely with exception of comments we received after we filed. Um, but just to unpack it a little bit, uh, there's an application uh, transmittal letter that gives a, a narrative explanation. Uh, also within the packet, you have several expert reports, a coastal resources assessment letter. That's uh, from our coastal resources expert, Megan Raymond from SLR who analyzed all the various coastal resources and uh, determined there was no adverse impact. And in, in many cases, uh, we're improving conditions over the existing conditions uh, down at uh, the, the parcel in Long Wharf. There's a um, traffic impact study 
uh, which is a required part of the application where we analyze uh, traffic patterns and traffic flows, which concludes that the levels of service are adequate and consistent with other city intersections and there are no safety issues. There's a conceptual stormwater report. I say conceptual because because this isn't really required as part of a PDD uh, because you need to have the actual detailed design elements before you can really do the calculation for stormwater. But we conceptually wanted to have a uh, design approach to stormwater uh, uh, treatment and renovation uh, because the city, that's been obviously a big issue for the city. Um, and then we also have a communication and storm preparedness plan, also not required, but um, we, we believe it's a, a wise plan for any building of any size to have. And I think recent experiences in and around the city with other large buildings will show that this is a direction most large buildings are moving toward to have sort of an orderly communication plan when needed. Um, and then lastly, the other item I, that we'll talk a, a good bit about is the Long Wharf Responsible Growth Plan. Many members of these committees uh, will recall this plan. It was several years in the making by uh, the city staff who worked dilig diligently on it, as well as uh, outreach to neighborhood groups and stakeholders uh, and uh, the state of Connecticut Office of Policy and Management uh, assisted in funding it. And we have several professional consultants who, who held design charrettes and really tried to uh, re-envision uh, what the city could do with the Long Wharf area because uh, as the fabric of the city has grown and uh, there's a desire to reconnect to parts of the shoreline that have been cut off by interstates and other factors, um, it was important to have a unifying plan for private developers to respond to and, and bring in projects. And I, I think this is probably the first project uh, that's come in under sort of uh, in furtherance of that plan. So let's go to the next slide. Um, so again, uh, you all know the area, Lynn described it, but just to be clear, the project site is outlined in yellow. It's, it's the area what, where there have been several restaurants, most recently Lenny and Joe's, but Leon's and the Rusty Scupper for those who go back a little further. Um, it is, as you can see, largely parking. And that's one of the reasons you'll hear that we're able to actually develop this site in a way that reduces the amount of impervious surface because we're getting away from this model of surface parking and uh, you know replacing it with green space except for the building uh, footprint. Uh, but you can see the challenges that this long wharf redevelopment has. It, it's a, it's a long-term plan. Uh, there's a lot of surface parking, there's tanks, uh, basically, you know, except for the Maritime Center, which is sort of an island of, of green landscape, uh, the rest of it is mostly pavement, uh, mostly, you know, from an earlier time and uh, uses that aren't really inviting to the general public. Uh, the idea is uh, slow, you know, one by one to uh, modernize those with the types of uses that the plan envisions. So uh, the next slide. Um, this is just a surface view of from, I think two days ago uh, down there, just to give you a sense of the feeling on the ground. If you're walking around, this is sort of the general feeling. This is taken from uh, the corner of water and East street uh, looking uh, towards the harbor. Um, again, it's, you know, it's not uh, the most inviting uh, of landscapes for pedestrians and residents to spend the day. Um, next slide. So the responsible growth plan really was looking to, uh, to reshape that area. The next slide, please, Brian. Um, next slide. This, this is just to remind everyone, this is what the the plan, the final report. This is actually a, a rendering from the final report. It's not our slide. This is just taken out of the report. And it called for looking to develop, redevelop and, and, and enhance five districts. Um, you can see them, each of them had a little bit of a tribute to their past of what's already there because there are certainly strong elements there, but it looked to build on those elements in a way that, uh, really transforms the area. Uh, our, the district we're gonna focus on is the one 
to the right in the forefront of the screen, that's called the Harbor District. Uh, if you can go to the next slide. This is a, again, from the city's Long Wharf Redevelop uh, Responsible Growth Plan. And this is zoomed in on that Harbor District. Obviously, it looks a lot different than the existing conditions slide that I showed you because this is the built out vision. Um, our portion of this district is you, you can locate the boathouse and you can see the Lenny and Joe's area, uh, which shows two or large sort of um, high rise buildings. And what the plan calls for is high density uh, residential and mixed use. And the, the reasoning, the logic behind it is to create a, a real self-sufficient neighborhood, you need to have people who live there. So something at a lower density or just commercial shops is really never going to be a complete part of the fabric of the city. Think of the neighborhoods we all live in, uh, although all of them have some commercial components, it's the residents that make it a neighborhood. People visit it, that enhances it, but you need to have a, sort of a civic density of activity where people are there because they live there and they're joined by people who are there uh, to visit and experience the area or shop or, or whatever uh, for business purposes. So that was the rationale that in the responsible growth plan, and that's what we're following through with. You'll see when we get to our uh, renderings, but uh, you know the, the rest of that Harbor District will take time to evolve, um, but they will all benefit from having a strong start with a core base of residents. And that's what we're proposing here tonight. So to do that, to sort of come full circle, uh, uh, Chairman Decker, to what I mentioned before and Chairman Douglas and Wingate, um, we, need to, uh, we need to amend the existing PDD. So again, this is an existing uh, plan development district that was originally created for the Maritime Center. It envisioned uh, the Maritime Center, a hotel and some other amenities, uh, including uh, access, which now has been, was amended to add the boathouse to it. So we just need that PDD to add to its allowable uses, uh, residential development uh, in the form that we're proposing it. So if we could have the next slide. Um, the, as, as you know, the standards uh, for the board to act on a PDD are, um, there are really four standards in the regulations. Uh, they're here, uh, just in sort of in, in summary, the board has discretion. This is a legislative act of the board and what they should measure their discretion against is, is the plan in accordance with the comprehensive plan of the city, including plans of redevelopment and renewal. And uh, the answer to that is that our plans are in accord. The comprehensive plan for the city uh, includes the Long Wharf redevelopment plan. I mean, a responsible growth plan that was uh, approved by the Board of Alders, I believe in uh, 2019. So it's actually part and parcel of the comprehensive plan. And uh, as you'll hear from uh, the staff reports and you've heard from me, our proposal really uh, follows that plan. In fact, is, is, is uh, the plan is the sort of design goal of, of, our, of our proposal. Uh, it should be composed of uses in, in such uh, proportions as are appropriate and necessary for the integrated uh, functioning of the city. Um, and, and, and that it is for the reasons I described, we need a, a certain civic density down there. The, the plan calls for uh, high density mixed use and that's what we're proposing. So it becomes a self-sufficient neighborhood. Uh, it should be designed in space, allocation, orientation, texture, materials, et cetera, uh, and character. So it complements the design and values of the surrounding neighborhood and shows unusual merit to reflect credit on the developer and the city. Uh, so we know the Maritime Center is really going to be the anchor of existing uses and these uh, buildings do complement the Maritime Center. They're in proportion and they're very uh, similar in design and quality. They're what are called type one buildings. So unlike a lot of development that you may have seen recently, they're, they're not wood built buildings. They're, they're uh, built with steel and concrete and other building materials 
that have um, you know higher uh, design value and higher performance, uh, and uh, that's required when you have buildings that are um, you know 13 to 15 stories high anyway. But but they're the type of permanent structures that if they're maintained, like the Maritime Center, you can look back in 35 years and they will look like the Maritime Center does, as if it was just built. Um, they, they stand up to the test of time and they, they will be a credit to the city. They'll be highly visible. As you all know, you can see the Maritime Center when you come across the Kew Bridge, when you come up uh, 95 going north or come down 91 or from various parts of and neighborhoods of the city, um, including uh, Hill South, which obviously has a great view of this area uh, looking, looking east. And it should be arranged in a way to provide a minimum 250 square feet of usable open space per dwelling unit. And, and we meet and exceed that number as well. So those are the, those are the zoning uh, elements and the zone, the, strictly speaking, the zoning request is, to, is a modification to allow residential. If we can go to the next slide. The um, companion uh, application that were required under New Haven ordinances and state law when you work in an area uh, in the coastal boundary, which is close to the water, um, you're required to also uh, submit uh, for review for consistency with uh, the Coastal Resources Management Act. Uh, so we did submit um, an application for, for that review as well. And uh, it was, um, we, we provided an expert report that went through each coastal resource element that's listed in the act and listed in New Haven's regulations and showed either those, if those resources were present, a lot of them aren't because remember Long Wharf itself, that area is built on historic fill. Uh, that area, you know, years ago was water. So that whole area is fill. So there's, you know, uh, landward of the, of, the, of the water, there's not, there's not a lot of uh, historic coastal resources because the material is not organic. Uh, natural material, it was fill material. Uh, and then waterward, there are a number of coastal resources that are common in urban coastal environments. Uh, and, and then there are some resources that just don't exist in that small area. But we went through each and, uh, and that's in, uh, the re in the materials you have and uh, concluded that we do not adversely impact any of those resources and we meet the criteria uh, uh, for the Coastal Management Act. Um, and the city plan uh, commission, we presented this uh, material all to the city plan commission as well and staff and they've reviewed it and staff's reports, which you have, and we'll probably hear about later, uh, conclude the same. Uh, we did receive comments uh, during this time. And one of the comments was a letter from the DEP and I'll just, I'll just comment on that. The DEP uh, letter made a uh, noted a couple of points, and I'll just go through them briefly. The DEP noted that sea level rise estimates uh, of up to 20 inches uh, by 2050 are, are the state standard, and that um, also there are storm surge and, and wave, uh, wave action risks associated with the, store, with the shoreline, and they provided information about that. Um, as, as we told the city plan commission, we were aware of those uh, estimates. We actually looked at the, those estimates and others, and we designed our project with, uh, with those in mind to be uh, you know, resistant and accommodate uh, potential sea level rise in the future. So we, we have our first floor elevation for our building uh, at 15 feet, which is uh, instead of 20 inches is 24 inches above the 2050 projection that the state uses as its plan, what's called the planning threshold. Uh, so our first floor uh, is, um, is at 15 feet, which is higher than the base flood elevation of 13 feet. Um, also our residential floor, that's the first floor at which there would be um, you know, residents living. That, that floor is at, uh, a, at 13 feet above the base flood elevation. So it's an elevation of 26 feet, six inches, which is a little bit more than 13 feet above what FEMA calls the base flood elevation. So we, we took that into account and we've also made design accommodations 
that are required by the building code for this area specifically to allow um, in the event of a storm to allow uh, floodwaters not to enter the building, but to flow into the lower levels and flow through the parking area, but not into the uh, commercial area and certainly not into the um, residential area, which is at elevation 26. Uh, DEP also commented that the residential development of Long Wharf and our site in particular would not be consistent with one element, in their opinion, of the Coastal Management Act that says that municipalities should uh, ensure that development uh, is proceeds in a manner that minimizes the risk and exposure of uh, people and property to uh, flood risks. Um, we, you know, we have respectfully disagree with them on, on this point um, the, uh, and disagree with the, the DEP assessment. It's not, uh, we, we exceed um, the safety standards uh, in New Haven for in New Haven's own flood damage prevention regulation. So New Haven does have a regulation and we exceed the elevation requirements for uh, that regulation. We also, as I mentioned, uh, have exceed the newly adopted building code requirements, which take into account uh, sea level rise and take into account uh, wave action uh, in, the, in the, what's called the coastal A. Uh, so we've taken care to manage risks and, and still build responsibly in a way that advances uh, New Haven's goal of, of redevelopment in Long Wharf. And that's, you know, frankly, what's in the responsible growth plan. Uh, the DEP also uh, references the state building code in passing. Uh, it doesn't say that we don't comply with it. It just says that we would have to comply with the requirements for what's called the BE zone. Um, and that's what we would comply with. Uh, so, um, but I just note that. And then finally, the DEP notes that uh, future efforts to armor the shoreline, which is what one strategy for keeping water out is to just build up or build uh, physical barriers. Uh, they say that, or to add flood and erosion uh, uh, structures, that those efforts in the future wouldn't be consistent with the Coastal Management Act either. Um, but we aren't proposing those. Again, we, we're not armoring because the policy for the uh, Coastal Management Act is not to armor. And, and that's what we've done. We have not armored. So I think they're, they're sort of looking ahead, but, um, but not it's not an element that's proposed in our plan. And then, you know, they, they just conclude that uh, for the re those reasons, they recommend uh, against uh, the consistency with the Coastal Management Act, but say that if the Board of Alders does approve uh, our proposal, they will continue to work with the city staff and us on the project. And that's what we intend to do. We obviously take these issues seriously, as you know, Fusco is already located in the, down on the uh, harbor. There's probably no person in New Haven or very few that have spent their day every day more than Lynn Fusco uh, on Long Wharf and is aware of, uh, of these issues and manages a building like the Maritime Center. So obviously we have planned for them and we have taken them into account. And I don't think you could have a better applicant who knows uh, the area and knows these conditions than you have here this evening. Um, so finally, uh, with all that in mind, city staff did take into account all those uh, uh, comments, did review, and as you know from the reports, recommend that our plan was consistent and would not impact the coastal resources. Um, so our request uh, to the uh, joint committee is to recommend our zoning modification with the accompanying uh, coastal management review to the Board of Alders for favorable approval. Um, this is a rendering of, of our proposal. Um, and Mr. Chairman, as I said, we, we are happy to take some questions now if you wanna talk about the zoning aspect or if you would like, we could have our design professionals uh, go through a little more of the general plan. Again, keeping in mind that it's not a detailed plan but it's just the vision uh, plan for the project? Um, I think we'll have your team uh, finish a presentation before questions. Um, but before you proceed, um, 
Uh, Attorney Rinelli, I'd like to recognize um, Alder Jeanette Morrison from the Legislation Committee um, who has joined us. And I think I also may have forgotten to acknowledge Alder Steve Winter, um, who is not on this committee, but does ably represent the 21st Ward. Um, so welcome Alder Morrison, welcome Alder Winter. Great, okay, well, thank you, Mr. Chair. We'll, we'll proceed then. I'm gonna ask if Mr. Lucas could uh, make uh, Mr. Jason Williams, uh, allow him to share his screen. Brian, while we're waiting, why don't you go to the next slide for Jason? Uh, Jason Williams is our landscape architect from uh, SLR, formerly Milona McBroom. Uh, and Jason, when he gets control of the screen, will walk you through the sort of public space that we're planning for this area, which we think is gonna be a terrific enhancement uh, over the existing conditions. And as Lynn said, really invite uh, neighbors and the city to visit New Haven shoreline, um, in particular, trying to connect and create synergies uh, to the west, down to the, the boathouse, Long Wharf itself, Long Wharf Park, and ultimately Hill South, and going the other direction uh, to the surprisingly close uh, Worcester Square neighborhood. So um, it looks like Brian is still sharing. Jason, in the interest of time, why don't we uh, go ahead and if it gets switched to you, we can we can do that, but I don't want to delay our presentation. Bet, you bet. I'll, uh... Okay, it looks like we may have lost Jason. Yeah, hold right. on. Let me uh, bring this up. Here. Okay. I also see that Alder DeCola is joining us. Um, Alder DeCola, who is a member of the Community Development Committee. Um, welcome, Alder DeCola. Uh, good evening, Alder DeCola. Nice to see you here from you again. Um, why don't we, in the interest, if uh, Jason's probably logging back on, maybe he got kicked off. Um, Brian, why don't we go to your, uh, show them the design and then we'll circle back to Jason. All right. Uh, good evening. I, I'm, I'm back. Okay. All right, Jason. And uh, good evening. Good evening, co-chairs and committee members. Uh, again, my name is Jason Williams. I'm a principal landscape architect with uh, SLR Consulting, 195 Church Street in New Haven, Connecticut. So aside from these white buildings, what you see here is essentially a two acre park. Uh, the Fusco design team from day one uh, created a vision and a goal to create a neighborhood waterfront public realm that provides barrier-free public access directly, directly from Long Wharf Drive down to the New Haven Harbor. Uh, aside from the diversity of all of the spaces within this two acre park, building one includes a waterfront food hall and market that creates the anchor that draws people to the site. We envision that on any given day, if you came to the site, you would see people relaxing on colorful lounge furniture and eating at cafe style tables around the market hall. Uh, there'd be families picnicking in the lawn areas with children running through uh, the coastal grasses that are swaying back and forth in the wind, a really activated and lively environment. And then as the sun sets and uh, it gets night, you'd start to see the dim glow from accent lighting um, throughout the site, uplighting sculptures, really providing this calming atmosphere where musicians are set up in one of the uh, different plaza spaces. People are gathering around the market area, sipping coffee, and people are sitting on the amphitheater style seating, looking south across the harbor at the sun going down. Uh, there really is a lot of choices once you leave the sidewalk in Long Wharf and enter the park. So I'd like to just walk you through some of them. So Brian, starting on the west side, coming from the boathouse on the existing sidewalk, you'd enter a concrete sidewalk that would take you south along the existing location of the Harbor Walk. 
This wraps around the site. And on the southern portion of the site, you can see these two gray areas identified as number 12. These are amphitheater style seatings with large granite blocks to gather and hang out with your family, a great place to meet people. In between these two amphitheater style areas are very lush coastal uh, plantings, large bands of grasses and perennials. And all of this creates a level of living shoreline that aids in wave attenuation and slowing down waves during, during heavy storm events. If we go back up to the top and you were to enter the site, you have another great option on the western side to access the upper plaza area of building one. You can take the handicap accessible walkway identified as 16. And as it starts to rise, you see a elevated boardwalk and overlook feature that gets you up to the elevated plaza of identified as number 14, the area just outside of the market. If we go back up to Long Wharf Drive and enter in between the two buildings, the buildings open up allowing wind and a lot of light in. And the first thing you're presented with is this beautiful sculpture uh, plaza space. On both sides of the plaza space, we have infiltration, bioinfiltration areas. And from this sculpture plaza, you have three entrances up into the project. On the left-hand side, you've got a handicap accessible walkway get, that gets you up to the lobby of building number one, a middle plaza gathering space and walkway, as well as the large wide uh, wa meandering walkway that takes you from concrete to boardwalk feature up and around and an elevated boardwalk that looks down on our large bioinfiltration area. As you move into the large plaza space identified as number eight, you'll see different types of seating. And if you were standing there looking to the lower right or to the southeast, you really have a lot of options. Walkways down to the lower harbor walk, to a new sculpture plaza with lawn seating blocks, a lawn seating area identified as number nine that looks down south to the plaza and links to the east to the existing sidewalk and on to the parking garage, which will be used as part of this site. To the north of building two, we have a drop off pickup area that makes its way up to a drop off plaza identified as number 18 for pedestrians to enter the lobby of building number two. The driveway heads back down to the existing loop road. Next. So while it looks like there is a lot going uh, on here, it is very organized. And you can see at the bottom of the page, there's four distinct colors that really identify the public realm use areas. The dark purple identifies outdoor dining, the green passive lawn spaces, the pink public gathering and event spaces where we expect musicians and building uh, management uh, to provide programming throughout all four seasons. And then in the uh, medium purple, engagement site elements. This graphic is important because it shows that with a simple stroll throughout the two acre park, you move through a series of different spaces. And it is the movement through these different spaces from active engagement to passive picnicking lawn spaces that really creates the excitement for not only Hill, uh, uh, the community to come down and experience the water, but also for the tenants in these buildings that are looking out their building, build windows down to this really activated park space. If we could continue on, I'd love to pass it over to Brian O'Connor with Cube 3 Architecture to discuss design goals and architecture. Great. Thank, thank you, Jason. <clears throat> Brian O'Connor, uh, founding partner of Cube 3. Uh, good evening to both co-chairs and members of both committees. My address Mr. is- Mr. O'Connor, can you also give us an address for the record, please? Yeah, absolutely. My address is 60 State Street, Boston, Mass. Thank you. Great. So uh, thanks again for your time. I, what I'd like to do very quickly, I'll, I'll try to keep this brief, is walk you through 
some of the initial design goals we established for the project. When, when Lynn and the rest of the team brought us on board, we took a huge step back and really tried to identify some of the core missions that this site and these buildings really had to deliver. And so we, we tried to identify six key goals um, and, and everything we're doing on the site, both all the, you know, the beautiful landscaping and plazas that Jason talked about in the design and form of these buildings really need to respond to these goals. So I'll walk through them quickly so, so we're all on the same page. I, the first and, and one of the most critical you'll note is a lot of these talk to the public realm and the public space. And the first of these is really reinforcing pedestrian access from the south. We have the Hill South neighborhood down there. We have the Canal Dock Boathouse. And as Lynn had mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, we really have an opportunity to use this site to sew together this pedestrian edge and really reinforce a connection from the south and reinforce connections across the site to the north where we have substantial parking uh, provided in the existing deck. The next thing we thought is we, you know, we really all have to understand it and recognize that the Harbor Walk is a public space. Um, it's a public space, both in spirit and, and in practicality. And what we really wanted to do is focus on this notion of public assembly, public access, public space. And so the delineation of this Harbor Walk and the connection of this Harbor Walk drove almost everything that we're doing, not only to provide residents of the site, but of the city and the neighborhoods direct access with views of the Harbor, proximity to the Harbor, and, and really re reinforce the sense of this as a waterfront community destination. The next goal was to really focus on the sense of place uh, and creating a destination. And again, I'm gonna go back to something that, that Lynn said at the beginning, we, we wanna put a there there. Um, and so there's a lot of different ways to do this, building on Jason's conversation about the beautiful outdoor spaces we, we want to really reinvigorate and put this place on the map. And so the idea is to take a substantial chunk of the ground floor of building one and create this public market space. And, and this is the market that lives indoors and outdoors, reinforces all of the spaces that we're creating. And then think about how the public lobbies or residential lobbies to these buildings also connect to this upper plaza area connect to the Harbor Walk and make this entire area a really rich and vibrant community benefit. The next thing is to think about how the organization and structure of these buildings reinforce this and allow the development and the creation of these beautiful public spaces. So we have a public edge sort of along the north side, Long Wharf Drive, where we're connecting Hill South, Worcester Square. And then we have the sort of public edge of the Harbor Walk in between the two, we, we have an opportunity to really manage the grading and, and manage these two public edges to come together and really build a rich public space in between. And so we wanted to work hard, and as Jason had mentioned, on developing this notion of a, of a transition between the public edge on Long Wharf Drive and the public edge on the water, and at the same time, manage the flood concerns that, that um, uh, Matt Rinelli had mentioned earlier. And then the last one, which I think is a, sort of a, a combination of a lot of these is to reinforce the notion of both visual and actual permeability of this site. Uh, we don't want to create a street wall along the edge of Long Wharf Drive. We want visual connections to the water. We want physical connections to the water. And we want the building forms and masses to support all of these design goals. And you can start to see a little bit about how these building forms start to lay themselves out on the site in, in almost an organic manner that, that relates back to Long Wharf Drive and really opens view corridors for the public and for the residents to take advantage of the water. Here you can see a very quick diagrammatic three-dimensional model of what we're talking about, where you have these sort of permeable edges, connections to the Harbor Walk, um, and then very public uh, areas that are notioned in red here. What I'm gonna do is very quickly walk you through the building uh, a couple of quick key floor plates, uh, and then a few quick images just to bring everyone up to speed. Here you can see building one and two. This is the lowest level of these buildings, which is access directly from Long Wharf Drive. We have uh, access to small parking areas down here, uh, building support and functionality only at this level. Uh, this is the level that had been mentioned earlier that has the sort of breakaway walls uh, not armoring the site, but allowing, you know, 100-year flood to come through. Uh, we have about 410 units distributed between these two different buildings. 
and about 8,000 square feet of amenity space within the buildings you'll see at the upper levels, as well as around 11 and a half thousand square feet of market. As we go up to the next level, this is really the market level. And Jason had talked about these sort of public or residential lobbies that allow flow through connection from the drop off through the lobby to these upper spaces intersecting beautifully with the public access down here up through this central park. And then really the heartbeat of this entire place in this area of building one, this whole sort of white area here is that public market. You can see you know, doors and access points spilling out to the south and the southwest, the southeast over to this overlooked deck area, and then very strong connections back to the inner plaza core. As we go up further, these are typical residential floors. One thing that's interesting to note here is you can see as the building steps back, we're sort of revealing these uh, deck plaza spaces on top of some of the lobby and amenity retail areas to allow this sense of terracing and layering to these buildings as they step up. And then when we get to the top floor, we've taken the south and southwestern edges of both of these buildings and completely eliminated units on the top floor of these to create these really wonderful roof decks to allow residents to have overlooked to the harbor and take advantage of the views and the sun orientation. A couple of very quick views. This is a shot you can see in the key plan down to the bottom. We're on Long Wharf Drive here looking north, the Canal Dock Boathouse on your right. And here you can see in the foreground that what Jason had mentioned, this sort of lower harbor walk that runs along the edge, and then that upper accessible path that comes up and creates this wonderful overlook looking out over the harbor. And then you can see the beginnings of sort of the market over in this area here. Uh, the building is, is, is really a fairly straightforward material palette building on sort of the flavor and the texture of New Haven. We have a lot of masonry, uh, metal panel, large windows, balconies, overlook conditions, and, and, and some really exciting articulation to these buildings. This is a quick view from the harbor side. Here you can see the, the energy of the site, really the market here, which again was visible from Long Wharf to the south. Now you can see it sort of in all its glory here. You have these outdoor amphitheater style seating elements that Jason had described, the spilling out of the park and public space between these buildings, connection to the lobby uh, on the building to the north, sculpture parks, and then these beautiful outdoor seating areas, all sort of organized around the idea that everything you see in the, at the ground plane is really public space. Quick view looking in the other direction. Now we can see between the building and you get this sense of sort of view corridor and permeability that we had talked about. The, the idea here is to make sure that this site above all else feels like a public space and it feels like it's open. So here you can start to see some of those plaza areas Jason was describing um, and some of those public connections. And then of course, at the lower part of the screen, sort of the connection back over uh, to the existing Harbor Walk running in front of the Maritime Center. In this view, you can also start to see some of those roof deck conditions that I mentioned earlier up here on the top edge of this building and on the edge of this building here. Then the last view is just a quick ground level view as you're walking down the Harbor Walk, connecting from Maritime Center, you can see into the sculpture garden and a very clearly delineated path curving around the edge, exposing these amphitheater style seating areas, and then the public pathways that traverse down between these buildings. So one, one thing I do want to cover really quickly, you know, we've talked a little bit about this coastal A zone, and, and I do just want to reinforce that, you, you know, we have a tremendous amount of experience on the team, sort of developing and understanding what's allowed and, and how the coastal A zone can work. So not only is this construction allowed in the, in the Connecticut State Building Code, but we, we have a large number of projects that we've undertaken through the years. And, and I just brought two to reference here. The, these are areas, this one's in Quincy, just south of the city on, on Boston Harbor, where the, these were sort of industrial wasteland sites. And this one in particular, um, the city had a vision for creating active waterfront. And what we did is we, we came in here and here we had a lower construction type. This is a wood frame building in a coastal A zone that went through Massachusetts DEP, uh, as well as Massachusetts General Law Chapter 91, public access to the waterways. And, you know, these are really fairly common projects that happen on the waterfront. I think the difference here is we are 
striving in this project to provide not only public access, but beneficial public access with these broad waterfront parks. Uh, we, we also have a much more robust construction type here, uh, as Mr. Rinelli had mentioned. Um, and, I, and I think at the end of the day, there, there's plenty of examples where you know, the vision for the waterfront can be realized within the coastal lay zone in a residential use, even with construction types that are less robust than what we're proposing here. So again, these all went through full coordination with DEP. Here's one other one. Uh, this is actually in East Boston, directly on the waterfront. Again, public access, public plazas. And, and again, I'll just say very quickly, the strategy for all of these buildings, whether they're wood frame, or they're, they're much more robust buildings, they, they have the same strategy. There's no residential below the base flood elevation, breakaway walls, and, and really just making sure that these are compliant with the, with the code. And they're, they're, quite, they're quite achievable. And I, I think to sort of build on that a little bit, one thing I'd like to do is just take one moment and very quickly walk you through a section that explains where the residential is relative to the water here. So we have a base flood elevation over here on the right of 13, and that's kind of the guiding, the guiding piece of the puzzle here. So we also have the existing seawall, and you can see mean high water down here at elevation 210. The minimum required elevation for the horizontal structure here is elevation 14, which we're compliant with, which is a foot above the base flood elevation. And then our market level is at 15, which is a full two feet above that. Um, what, what's really of note here is that the first residential units are up at elevation 26.6, uh, you know, substantially above that base flood elevation. And then just for reference, uh, the red dotted line that cuts through here is sort of the existing grade that you have on site in this area, just as a, a reference point. So at, at this point, I think uh, Mr. Ranelli might want to pause again to see if we're going to continue. Yeah, um, uh, Chairman Decker and Chairman Wingate, uh, we, so again, be trying to be mindful of the time. We're excited about the project. We want to share as much as possible, but um, we do have our subject matter experts for stormwater, uh, coastal resources, and traffic. And so I will see if you would like to ask us questions or if you'd like us to have those three professionals prevent, present the reports that are in your application materials. I would say they're both, they're, the three of them are pretty relatively quick uh, compared to uh, what we've had. They're you know, two or three slides a piece, uh, but we'll take your direction. Um, I would say that you should continue and finish up um, and hopefully we can uh, keep these last sections compact. Okay, great. Let's, uh, we'll go back to Mr. Williams uh, yep. to do the utility, the utilities. Yeah, this is Jason Williams with SLR Consulting, 195 Church Street, New Haven, Connecticut. This graphic just shows an, uh, an, the existing grades that are out on the site. You can see on the left-hand side, on Long Wharf, we're at approximately elevation eight and nine, and we gradually climb uh, to the south to elevation 13. On the upper right-hand side, if you were on the harbor, uh, harbor Walk and you were looking west, you can see in the background the existing boathouse, uh, which has a deck elevation actually of nine feet two inches. Uh, the existing seawall that we are not touching that is on our site is at, a, uh, is at five feet eight inches. And the 2050 mean high water um, is at four feet six inches. So you can see that in 2050, we're still not getting up to the top of our uh, seawall and current mean high water way down at two feet, 10 inches. If you were to turn around 180 degrees, you'd be looking uh, to the east and in the background lower picture, you can see uh, the existing maritime center that has the continuation of the five foot eight inch seawall, but another uh, higher seawall um, to the left uh, that's up at elevation 12 feet, eight inches. Next. Uh, we are handling storm water um, creatively on this site. Um, we are, the blue arrows identify all of the slopes um, that we are uh, moving the water um, away from our buildings 
and away from uh, walkways into the light blue bioinfiltration areas. So this is a uh, best uh, 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 management practice that takes all of the storm water and essentially holds it into depressional areas so that it can infiltrate into the ground. Uh, on the right hand side, you can see a couple of these images of the bioinfiltration areas that can really be incorporated into very modern plaza spaces, but also uh, left open so that we can incorporate a lot of diversity of plant species uh, into these areas. Not only do they help us to control the stormwater and slow it down before it hits a high level overflow and then goes on to uh, the city's uh, storm system, but by keeping that moisture in this area, we essentially are getting free irrigation, creating microclimates, increasing pollinator species into the area. And again, just creating that color and textural diversity and vibrancy for the two acre park. Next. So we did a very preliminary, preliminary review of the existing uh, utilities uh, with, uh, adjacent to our site using uh, city mapping. And as you can see, we've got sanitary, water, gas, and electric, uh, telecommunications, and uh, storm drainage all on Long Wharf uh, and Hamilton. Uh, two major uh, elements on the west of our site and the east of our site are the uh, light blue stormwater pipes, which are draining a significant portion of the downtown. Um, both of these pipes are to remain. We're not gonna be touching them. Uh, they do have manholes associated with them uh, that we will be tying into. <laughs> Next. Our utilities are pretty straightforward because on the top uh, Long Wharf Drive, we've got sanitary sewer in green. You could see uh, uh, straightforward making sanitary sewer connections. Uh, in light blue, there's a nice water line which is running along uh, Long Wharf, which we can tap into. And then uh, throughout the site, we've got a series of high level overflows in the infiltration areas, as well as area drains in our plaza space that are conveying storm water to three locations. Uh, building number one and the surrounds are taking the storm water to an existing manhole on the left-hand side with the orange dot. Everything on the north of building number two and our drop-off area is taking water to an existing manhole in Long Wharf Drive. And everything to the south of building one and two is conveying water to an existing manhole uh, on the eastern portion of the site. Overall, we are, we are improving uh, conditions from uh, pre to post construction with a decrease in, in the impervious area. Uh, with the use of our uh, bioretention or bioinfiltration areas, um, we are meeting uh, the 2004 uh, Connecticut Deep Storm Water Quality Manual, which looks to address that first flush, that first one inch of rain that comes down and providing water quality uh, for that. And you can see um, we are required uh, to provide uh, approximately 11,000 cubic feet of, of uh, water quality volume and we are up at uh, over 15,000. Um, additionally, we conform to the sec to section city of the city of New Haven zoning ordinance to retain and infiltrate uh, that first inch of rainfall coming down. Great, thanks. Thanks. Uh, at this point, uh, I'd like to turn it over uh, to Megan to discuss um, the coastal resources areas. Great. Thanks a lot, Jason. Good evening. My name is Megan Raymond. I'm a principal scientist at SLR and the Wetlands and Waterways Lead. Um, I'm a professional wetland scientist, certified floodplain manager, um, and have been evaluating the project as it relates to the CAM standards, the Coastal Area Management Standards. I sit in an office with Jason at 195 Church Street in New Haven. Um, you've heard a lot about, about the project area, so I'm just going to kind of uh, describe the, the site attributes, the existing conditions, and proposed as specific to the, the resources and definitions within our Connecticut Coastal Management Act. 
Um, what we're, the site is about four acres is what we're looking um, to work in. It's comprised of these three parcels. As you've heard, the site is obviously existing. It's existing and developed. There's development currently on the property comprised largely of a, a large surface parking area, an existing uh, restaurant that's fallow, and a small area of lawn with the harbor walk that bounds about approximately 700 linear feet of shoreline on New Haven Harbor. Um, the site is comprised of fill material. This is all human transported fill material. There's no native soil uh, within the project proper. Um, and again, we have a, with a site that's bounded that transition to the coastal environment is comprised of a vertical wall, comprised of a variety of, of materials. We have some areas that are um, that are block um, stone. As you move to the east, there is a there's a there's actually off site to the east. There's a vertical steel sheeting retaining wall. But we have this vertical structure that comprises that interface between upland area and um, and our and our coastal area, our marine environment. Um, the site does exist within the inner portion of New Haven Harbor. New Haven Harbor is quite long and broad. Um, we have the Mill River and the Quinnipiac River that confluence just north of the Quinnipiac River Bridge. Then New Haven Harbor extends approximately four miles down to uh, you know, beyond Lighthouse Point to the to the bounding um, breakwaters that 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 protect the harbor, um, and that's approximately four miles away from from where our site is positioned. Um, moving from our southern portion of the project, um, we have New Haven Harbor is classified as an estuarine embayment um, per the Connecticut uh, Coastal Management Act. It's because we have a mix of salt water coming in from Long Island Sound, as well as the freshet uh, from the Mill River and the Quinnipiac River. So we're in an estuarine embayment uh, coastal environment. As you move up to the shoreline of our site, again, we're at this vertical wall, approximately 700 uh, linear feet, a little bit longer on our southern face as our as opposed to our western and and this area um is is again the confining layer we have our our coastal jurisdiction layer um, line at elevation 4.6 hits the vertical wall as a line below that we have a mean high water line at elevation 2.8 we have a narrow intertidal area that is exposed when the water um, is at low tide approximately minus 3.3 about a six foot tidal range here and that intertidal area here is comprised largely of riprap and stone anthropomorphic um, material and there's been some colonization of some rockweed and some seaweeds, as well as you can, um, some oysters are visible. Um, along with these three stormwater outlets, we have these existing three stormwater outfalls from the city, um, city storm sewer system, uh, two along our southern face and one up in the, the north uh, or the, the, the western portion of the site. Um, the looking again now we're in the upland portion of the site we're actually on the property itself and our coastal resource areas there are comprised of the coastal flood hazard areas there are three flood zones that are mapped in proximity to the project area we have two velocity zones that exist on the wall itself elevation 13 to the west elevation 16 to the east but that transitions quickly to the interior portion of the site where we have that AE, that mapped 100 uh, year flood uh, flood zone coastal AE up to elevation 13. And that, that has been our design elevation for a lot of the, the elements that are proposed um, with the project. Um, when we look at the site, in, obviously in our coastal environment, we're bound by the by the promulgation of the Connecticut Coastal Management Act to, to achieve consistency with the legislative goals and policies. And that's been, um, that has been known and, and um, designed for and attained through the development of the site plan. And a large anchor of that has to do with all of the preceding, um, preceding descriptions that my colleagues went into great detail on. And that has to do with just the public realm, the public space that is going to um, activate the site. We're looking at a site that is going to um, allow for residential uses. We're going to introduce um, the ability of people to live in this area, as well as visit this area with the, with the variety of public amenities. And that relationship, that that creation of of that um, that feature, will allow for the appreciation and understanding of the harbor, and sort of and and in turn develop a stewardship of the harbor over time. We're going to be able to um, allow for visual access to the harbor for visitors, as well as the consistent um, the consistent residents um, through the apartments for the for the 
property um, for the dwellers that that rent down here. And that's really um, that's really been um, a driving force in terms of just accentuating the value of the harbor by introducing the stewardship co component, by introducing a public space where we allow um, we allow the appreciation of this valuable resource. Um, in terms of the coastal resources, we looked at the site um, consistent in the design elements to the, the FEMA National Flood Insurance Program standards, and that is allowed for by maintaining sufficient elevation to our base flood elevations. We've incorporated a resilient design by allowing for vegetation and increase um, in stormwater management measures to improve water quality. We've uh, kind of set up the, the entire site design to allow for more vulnerable, um, no, more vulnerable portions of the site, the parking and the open space areas to, to, to experience periodic inundation from high frequency, uh, low frequency, high intensity storm events. And that, um, that making way for water has been a part of this, this design process. Um, the, the important point to note here is that the, 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 the buildings are sufficiently protected to allow for maintenance of the life and property provision, um, which is obviously a, a, a cornerstone of the CAM as well. Um, as well within all of this is again, what Jason just described, the protection of water quality through the improvement of stormwater management. We're able to remove and reduce a great deal of surface parking in favor of subsurface parking areas. We can pull back um, shoreline structure to allow more space between the shoreline area and the proposed infrastructure introducing a great deal of coastal vegetation, native vegetation. And we're able to do all this without further armoring the shoreline. We have, we have sufficient freeboard along the, 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 the face of the wall itself. We do have that low point at 5.8 um, inches in our, in our southwestern portion of the site. It slopes up from there. But we have sufficient freeboard given the existing mean high water elevation of 2.8 to accommodate that planning standard of the 2050 without further armoring the, the, the shoreline, which again is consistent with CAM. So I'm happy to answer any questions as we get into it, but, um, but that's been our summary of the, of the Connecticut Coastal Management um, Legislative Goals and Policies as opposed, um, uh, yeah, that's actually that's, this is the this is the um, the summary that I just got into. Sorry, I, I went all ahead and, and just talked to that one slide. But anyway, this is a, a, a reiteration of what I just described, the cornerstone being public access, improvement of water quality and NFIP compliance. Again, happy to answer any questions and I'll turn it over to Dave and um, to discuss the traffic study. Thank you so much. Thank you, Megan. Uh, I'm Dave Sullivan. Slide, Brian. I'm Dave Sullivan. Um, I'm with SLR. I manage the uh, traffic and transportation planning. Thank you uh, for giving me the opportunity tonight. I'll um, like to give you a brief summary of the. Uh, Mr. Sullivan, can you give us your address for the record, please, before you begin? Uh, sure. I'm uh, at uh, 195 Church Street. Thank you. Proceed. Uh, you'll see in the uh, graphic to the right the a general location of the site and the study intersections we selected for this study. Um, they include uh, the two intersections on either side of Canal Dock Road, uh, Sergeant Drive and Long Wharf Drive, and uh, on Water Street, uh, the two intersections, one with East Street and uh, Long Wharf Drive and one with uh, uh, Hamilton Street, and then Hamilton Street and Long Wharf Drive. So we surrounded the, uh, the site pretty well. Um, the uh, first thing we needed to do was to establish the uh, base traffic volumes uh, being um, uh, unusual times, to say the least, for traffic uh, with uh, uh, the pandemic ongoing. Um, we did collect new counts, but uh, we relied on older counts that were pre-pandemic counts uh, to adjust those counts in general, um, looking at the, the differences in some station uh, traffic, we increased it by 33%. Uh, that information um, will be uh, reviewed by Connecticut DOT, Bureau of Policy and Planning. That was the basis of our analysis. Um, what were, were we analyzing? Well, we established how much traffic would be generated uh, in the morning peak hour based on uh, industry data. Um, we estimate 187 trips total to and from the site. Um, in the afternoon, 380 trips. Uh, that's what we based our analysis on. However, I point out that we took these uh, numbers 
straight out of the um, industry standard journals. And in fact, they do not account for things like uh, shared trips or uh, multi-purpose trips, for instance, uh, uh, people that are going to the market that live in the residences. Uh, so these are somewhat conservative. And e even under those conservative assumptions, what we found is that operations in the surrounding intersections are generally a D or better, where there's traffic lights, where they're unsignalized, the level of service was C or better. And uh, we found that essentially the um, levels of service would not be impacted once we added this traffic to it. Um, we also looked at the sight lines from the proposed driveways. And in fact, uh, the sight lines are fine for the, uh, the posted speed limit along Long Wharf Drive. Um, you know, so, so where do we go from here? Um, we will continue to work with the city. We had some preliminary, uh, a preliminary conversation with uh, Bruce Fisher. We'll continue to coordinate with him um, and his uh, transportation staff. And um, we also will be going to the Office of State Traffic Administration because this uh, qualifies as a um, major traffic generator under their definitions. So there are some uh, checks to still go, but our uh, findings through our traffic study are that there will not be an impact. I skipped over the first bullet point, which is the strong bicycle and pedestrian network. because I wanted to spend a little bit of uh, time on that because I think it's important. Um, if you can go to the next slide, please, Brian. Um, th this is uh, uh, what we tried to do was pull out uh, some of the bike facilities that are in the area because it, it's quite compelling when you look at our site and you look at this great public space that's being created here. Um, the being able to access this by other than motor vehicle um, is important. The sidewalk network, of course, is is. Uh, very robust in the area, but the bike network is as well, and it's getting stronger. In green, um, we show all of the uh, um, uh, the bike facilities that exist, whether, whether they're um, 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 on road or uh, separated side paths. But they're they're exclusive bike facilities, and you can see the uh, a complete loop there. Now, where they do tend to terminate right now is where the blue dotted arrow um, uh, coalesces with the green arrows and that cycle track will be um, extended. So the blue is the Farmington Canal Trail phase four, which is currently under construction. So when that blue is completed, you see there's a nice link directly into downtown over the tracks via Grove Street um, to this area. So it's uh, robust, getting robuster. And uh, as we look forward there, we can look forward to some of these other future connections, which are shown in the, uh, the pinkish colors there. Um, and we um, continue to, to monitor this. There's uh, a study that's ongoing now. Where we're hoping to get an update uh, for tonight's meeting. It's a safe routes for all study that's uh, uh, being conducted for the city uh, by street plan. We contacted street plan today. They've completed the study. However, they're, um, uh, they're in draft form and it's being reviewed by the steering committee in the city. So um, we'll continue to follow that. Uh, but this is good news. This is uh, great news for uh, a public amenity that's being added and having the infrastructure um, for people to access it. So thank you. And I guess I'll turn it back to uh, Matt. If I uh, correctly. Thank you, Dave and, and everyone. Uh, Chairman Wingate, Chairman Decker, thank you for allowing us to uh, to go a little longer than you're probably used to, but we thought, um, you know, it was it would be helpful to see the whole vision. But just to, well, I guess two things. One is before I forget to, uh, we do want to thank um, city staff at city uh, city plan uh, and the city engineer and traffic and uh, economic development who all have been in very regular communication with us and. We also would like to thank and, and very helpful uh, providing comments from early design to now and Alder Rodriguez in particular, who has uh, helped us um, you know, collect and incorporate comments from the community in particular. Um, so we wanna thank them. And I guess I just wanna then sort of bring you back. We, we started off with, this is a zoning modification accompanied by a uh, coastal resource review. Um, that's what's in front of you. These are the standards. I won't go through them again 
for that action, but then we also presented to you what's in the regs called our general plan, although we have a little more fleshed out, but it, but but it you know we wanted to show how it met the vision of the uh, responsible growth plan. So I will I will pause there. Like I said, I just wanted to sort of bring us back to what the application is that's in front of you after that uh, tour through the site. Um, but I will pause. We are sure there are questions, and we we we'd love to. Uh, try to provide you the information you need um, to render your decision. So thank you. Great, thank you all. Um, I will now open the floor to colleagues uh, who have any questions for this team. Um, if you have a question, please um, raise your hand uh, virtually or uh, Al, if you uh, can stop the share screen that I can also look at people's windows. Um, we also colleagues um, have several members of city staff in the attendees list. Um, I want to give everyone a chance to ask questions specifically of um, the FOSCO team first uh, before bringing in city staff. But um, if you have questions that you think that city staff um, would answer well, then uh, you'll have your chance. Um, but first, I'm going to recognize um, Alder Edwards, who will be followed by Alder Kupu. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm going to start off with my easy questions, and I'll build it up when we go around to the next round. Um, I just had a question about the traffic study, and if you really analyze the weekend traffic patterns, because the weekend traffic patterns are going to be much much different than our weekday traffic patterns in that area. So yeah, would I you think- like us, Would you like yeah. us to respond as we go? That would be fine. I could, uh, you know, we could go each question. That. Okay, Dave, why don't I turn it over to Dave Sullivan? Uh, he can answer that. Sure. Uh, and when we, um, granted the travel, travel patterns are different. There are certain protocols that we go through when we, we start a study and make a determination of what the, the peak hours are that will be um, evaluated. And what we look at are the land use and the, um, the surrounding commuter um, characteristics. In this particular case, it's, it's, since it's largely retail, I mean, uh, residential, I'm sorry, um, residential and commuter traffic was the, the combination um, that was uh, the most critical. Uh, so we, which is very standard uh, protocols, but we looked at uh, both um, both weekday peak hours. Okay, and in that study, are you taking into account the traffic that's gonna loop around from the other side where we have our food truck paradise and, and we have our visitors as well? Yes, what we have uh, accounted for all the, what's considered background traffic, would be the traffic that would be there, whether or not this development was developed. So okay. we did in fact uh, include whatever future development was uh, projected to be there. Okay, thank you, Mr. Sullivan. And just the second part to this is, um, you talked a lot about space and you talked a lot about public space, open space, public space, public space, I heard 14 times. Is this true public space for myself? Yes. For a member of the New Haven community and not just someone that's going to be a dweller. Is that, that, this? That, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll take that, uh, Alder Edwards. Yes, uh, it, it will be owned. It's not going to be like turned over and deeded to the city, but there is, is as we said, unrestricted. Uh, there's no fences, there's no gates. Uh, it is open. That is part of our design. As, as uh, Megan Raymond said, that's the water dependent use is allowing the public in. And for us, our view is for this project to be successful uh, with that market, we need to have the public there. So the answer is yes, it's open to the public. Okay, and this is part of that same question. And this may be something for, I don't know if it's for you or the city, Mr. Ranelli, but in any event, how do you gauge that you're gonna keep this open to the public? Is there an who will sign with the city. This is gonna be open for a thousand years. This is gonna be open to the public for a hundred years. Or are we gonna have a decision made after a couple months? Oh, this whole public thing is not working out. Uh, I think, I think uh, as I said, it will, be, it will be owned by the owner because the other thing is it needs to be maintained. 
by the owner. So uh, we intend to continue to own it. But as I said, the the success of the project, if we don't have uh, those spaces activated with the public, the market will fail, the public spaces will fail. Uh, so that's really the strongest uh, the strongest um, sort of assurance. But yes, no, it, it will be open. Uh, it's part of our proposal. That's what we've intended. We've said it here publicly. So uh, that's that's the plan. But there is no deed, as if as I said earlier, we're not deeding it over to anyone. So this is like a handshake. We shake um, hands. Uh, well, I, I, I it, it it is a component of the zoning because to have the uh, water dependent use, mm -hmm. what we've identified as our water dependent use is. Uh, the public access and use of those observation areas, which is according to the state statutes and guidance, the mm -hmm. a water dependent use. So we do need to keep it open. I mean, we have a regulatory reason to need to keep it open. All right. Thank you. I have no further questions at the moment, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Alder Edwards. Alder Kupo. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I have a question about um, the 410 units. Um, and a really unhappy kid who I can't watch Elmo with. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, what portion or percentage of these units will be set aside for affordable housing? So we, we have, um, you know, uh, followed the affordable housing discussion. Uh, we've said in uh, our public meetings with residents and in front of city plan that we intend to have uh, an affordable component. Uh, here um, and Fusco as a longtime resident uh, of, of the city, corporate citizen and employer understands the value of it. So we do intend to have a component. We don't have a percentage yet because we are at the zoning portion. Uh, our intent would be when we get to detailed design and we know a little more about uh, the costs associated with it and the um, other tax treatment of the affordable units towards the project, et cetera. Uh, we'll be able to put a number on it, um, but we have, as I said, uh, we understand what's in the IZ reg right now, uh, the, the levels the city is, uh, you know, heading toward, um, and, uh, you know, there are obviously some other terms involved there that, that aren't, uh, you know, aren't final. I don't think it's uh, been adopted fully yet, but uh, our intent is to, is to provide an affordable component. The, the amount, the exact percentage and exact um, terms, we don't have uh, detailed until we have more design, you know, costs and other other elements. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, you know, I heard uh, frequently um, in this presentation, um, this self-sufficient neighborhood intending to create a neighborhood. And I think the thing that I would want this body to consider, especially when you're talking about pricing, is what neighborhood exists in New Haven without a neighborhood where working people can afford to live. Um, and so I would hope that you keep that in mind um, when making a decision about what percentage of those units are priced below market rate. Um, and then separately, I have a question. Um, will you be applying for state or federal funding for this project? Yeah, Alder Cooper, first of all, just thank you for those comments and, and we understand the importance of that and um, you know we all live in the community and know there are a lot of people who are below that level who are contributors to our community and really the in many cases the uh, the anchors for that community so we, we understand your concern with regard to state and federal funding no we are not applying for any uh, funding thank you mr Shea. that's all i have for um, at this time Thank you, Alder Kubo, and, and thank you, Hunter, for the for the contributions as well. Um, further questions, Alder Furlow. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you uh, for this presentation. Um, I am sure that CPC did an excellent job in reviewing all of this uh, information for us in advance, since they've issued a favorable report for us to consider. Um, and I didn't see it and the presentation was lengthy. I may have <laughs> just not caught it, <laughs> but um, I am interested in the parking. Uh, and so uh, how many parking spaces will there be for tenants? How many will there be for 
the businesses and for those that are visiting. Just a, around power, a, a um, an estimate. Okay, sure. I'll I'll start and then I'll turn it over to Dave Sullivan. Um, the the plan for parking was not to create more surface parking and not to create new parking structures. The the benefit we have is that when Maritime Center was built, the parking garage was overbuilt uh, for parking. So that existing parking garage has, uh, I believe, 1,800 spaces. Um, and the current occupancy, uh, Lynn, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, is around 400 of those spaces. Uh, uh, and during the pandemic, <clears throat> we've not had more than 362 cars. Right. And, and so prior to that, there were more, but there is, based on our uh, projections, there is... Uh, a surplus of additional space there. So we intend to use that garage for parking. Um, and we also hope as uh, Dave Sullivan indicated that uh, a lot of our residents or we're planning for residents, not all of them need to own a car uh, because of the connectivity to the city, but certainly many of them will and they'll have visitors who will. And we hope the air, the, the attractions will have visitors that will and that uh, the parking garage, uh, you know, level of uh, use, the capacity is adequate to handle that. Dave, can you uh, add any more to that? Uh, well, I could just uh, echo a little bit what you're saying, but, um, you know, again, we don't have the traditional statistics here because it is such a, uh, a unique location. Um, but again, there's 1800 spaces in the garage and uh, as Lynn says, a vast majority of that is vacant now. And that's largely why we have such a, uh, a, a unique ability to have these two small parking areas. So we're really adding a small amount of parking. And this is really an area where uh, a valet operation will take place. Um, so we're not adding a lot of parking because we feel there already is a lot of parking. Not to mention there's a significant amount of on-street parking uh, there today. Uh, just within a stone's throw of the site are probably uh, 50 or so on-street parking spaces, which are uh, which are uh, available for the general public. So um, we will be refining the parking plan, um, but for um, our initial review of it, uh, there's a, a, an abundance of parking out there um, that's available in the garage, which is is, is really what you like to do with parking. You don't like to create parking if you don't have to, um, because it's a, it's an asset that that uh, is really negative, in my opinion. Yeah, and Alder Farlow, just to put some estimates around. I mean, if you anticipated 1.5 cars per uh, apartment, you're at around 615 spaces. And again, given the 1,800 spaces there, uh, you know, more than enough uh, capacity. Just an, another quick question, if I may, Mr. Chair, um, in regards to parking. So, so I'm not going to include the on-street parking because we have the harbor there and other activities. And so I don't think that should be considered a part of your parking plan. But the 1800, I used to work at the Maritime Center uh, some years ago when the phone company was there. And so I'm just trying to remember the parking lot is if you're facing the street, I think it's to the left of the Maritime Center. Correct. And so there are 1,800 parking spaces there. How far of a walk would that be for where you're gonna be building? What, what's that distance approximately? Uh, we, can, we, can, we can have someone calculate it or look at it on the, on the map, but I'm, my, I'm gonna eyeball it at about probably 800 feet or okay. so. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that, that's that's fine. Yeah, I'm just trying to get. I'm, I'm trying to imagine what what how far that a parking lot is from uh, yeah. where um, I lose my car and stop and shop, so I'm not good <laughs> at measuring out spaces. <laughs> um, and my last question in regards to the parking is: uh, Will that parking lot be free, or will it be under, um, or will it have a cost incurred? It, it will continue to have a um, parking fee. Um, 
residents will probably have, you know, one type of pass and visitors another, like, like most parking garages, but it needs to have a fee to maintain it in, in the condition it's been maintained in. Great. Um, and I think that's it for now, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alder. Um, I have Alder Marchand, then Alder Douglas. And then if anyone else has questions uh, specifically for the Busco team, please get on the queue um, and then we'll, we'll bring in um, the folks from the city departments to uh, give their perspective, hopefully uh, fairly briefly. Uh, but Alder Marchand, you're up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And let me just first uh, acknowledge that uh, I am a member of the city plan commission. Uh, this team made a presentation a couple of CPC meetings ago, and then the public hearing began, and then the public hearing concluded in the subsequent city plan meeting. I was there for the first meeting, but not there for the second meeting. So I got to hear the presentation and asked a few questions, but I was not there when the commission voted, although the commission did vote unanimously to recommend approval. Um, I just wanna make sure that I'm crystal, crystal clear because I've reviewed all the materials and I've heard your presentation a couple of times now about the exact, change to the PDD, which I take to be uh, amending the text of the PDD to allow residential uses and, and a resident uh, up to 500 uh, residences. Um, but I wonder, and, and then, and then the, 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 the general plan is part of the PDD uh, submission. Um, but the thing I wonder is residential zones have other requirements. Uh, for residential uses, including loading zones and parking requirements. And so are you, does your PDD amendment bring into the PDD those parking requirements and those loading zone requirements and those other requirements uh, oh. as well? And, and you know, like setbacks and other things that apply in a residential zone or is it just allowing the use? Uh Alder Marshawn, thank you for the question. It's, it's, it's allowing the use, and you'll see there's a zoning data table contained in the City Plan Commission report that describes the other elements. But uh, unlike a traditional zoning district, a PDD uh, doesn't always have those components. The, the, the point of a PDD the, is it's a zoning tool. Not all cities or towns have it. It's particularly useful in cities where the environment is fully built out. So you have essentially infill uh, developments or second generation development. And the intent is the reason to have it as opposed to just creating traditional districts is uh, to allow for the flexibility uh, uh, of, of, of that unique district. So when this district was adopted in 84, um, it was PDD 53, which is pretty early on the list of PDDs, uh, but they, uh, it did not include uh, specific meets and bounds uh, or, or bulk and area standards like you would expect in a normal district. Um, there, there were some details, uh, but not setbacks and those types of things. So the idea was to show the building that you wanted to build, generally the location, et cetera, and those would literally form the text of the district. So the, the text of the district includes the general plan. So our, so our, in terms of setback, what, is, you know, what does that mean to your question? Uh, I would say that what it means is that the setbacks we're showing are the setbacks you know, generally that we need to achieve. Staff has some discretion at the detailed phase for minor adjustments mm -hmm. for field conditions, et cetera. But we can't then, like for example, we're showing buildings that don't create a building edge. So what Brian O'Connor meant by that is we're not creating a flat linear surface along Long Wharf that's just a wall of building that you would drive by. We have those. So that's part of the district. We have to show that articulation and we can't just line up on the building line and, and, and change that. Thanks for that explanation. And of course uh, that makes sense. Um, so the brief answer is the only thing that's really changing in, in terms of the text is allowing the residential use, but the general plan sets forth um, the design of the building so that you can understand what the setbacks and bulk uh, parameters are for the project. Right, the characteristics, the density. And then the, you're not proposing a certain parking uh, 
requirement per unit, you are saying here's the garage that is nearby, which we think will be adequate. Right. So any future use of that garage would have to accommodate the fact that this development uses it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, on the question of public access, um, I, I've read the material and I've also seen the re response that uh, your team uh, wrote uh, after the first city plan meeting where someone from Save the Sound talked about uh, the project and others had criticisms. They felt like it didn't afford enough public access. And so in the letter, you specifically talked about <clears throat> how the, 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 the project team decided not to build a pier or a dock. Could you say more about that? Yes, so- Wouldn't it be nice if your residents could just come out of the building, walk through the pretty garden and grab their boat and walk to the end of the dock? Wouldn't that be amazing <laughs> amenity? It, Why it wouldn't you be, wanna do that? It might be nice. And as you know, the, uh, the, the sort of, you know, general aspirational plan in the, uh, in the Long Wharf Responsible Growth Plan does show the ability to put a pier in. So I'll, let me start with that. There's nothing we're proposing here that will prevent the future addition of a pier. Uh, but uh, candidly, um, we didn't want to build one. They're uh, expensive. The permitting requirements are uh, extensive. And you may not, well, you may know, that uh, when the Maritime Center and PDD 53 were adopted, they did include other elements like a marina and docking over, actually wharfing over the area between the boathouse and, uh, and uh, Lenny and Joe's. And all of those were denied by DEP. So uh, we did not want to take that on at this point. And I, I, candidly, I, I think if we had proposed a pier, we'd probably have some of the same groups uh, suggesting that the pier would disturb uh, the marine environment. So there are nice things about a pier and it, you know, it might be a nice addition one day. We, we don't preclude that from happening, but we are providing uh, 700 linear feet of space. And really if it got so crowded along those 700 linear feet that people felt like it would be nice to have a couple more linear feet, then a pier might be supported. But right now they have the boathouse, which has a long wharfed pier. And you actually have the remnants of long wharf, which is a great pier. So we feel like there is ability for people to use those. If we draw them down there and they want to get further out into the water, they're really literally a stone's throw away. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that response. Um, on the question of the public access, I appreciated the questions from my colleague from the 19th Ward. Uh, and I appreciated your response. In other places in the city, like around the Quinnipiac River and the Mill River, uh, the city has negotiated easement arrangements with private developers that were developing properties along the, the, the uh, river coast. Mm -hmm. um, and, and they did that in order to preserve the ability to extend a network of trails around the Mill River, for example. And have you had conversations or was that ever a part of the conversation with the city about an easement agreement where the city would be guaranteed access to uh, a, like the immediate pathway adjacent to the shore? The, the, um, the subject of an easement has never come up in our dealings with the city. Uh, but again, I think that's because, and, and those other instances maybe were slightly different positions, mm -hmm. but, but that's because um, we're proposing it as our water dependent use. So mm -hmm. there is a regulatory requirement for us to maintain it. Um, I, you know, I, I would be happy to talk to the city more about it. I, I mean, candidly, we're not eager to give easements or land rights to the city uh, where, we, where we don't need to. I mean, that's just the nature of private property. But, but what we are saying is, uh, you know, this is part of the review process that we provide this access as one of our water dependent uses. So just like any other regulatory requirement, you know, it can be enforced. Finally, and thank you, Mr. Chair, for your patience. This is my last question, which, uh, you know, a lot of the discussion around this project and a lot of your application and the materials uh, address potential environmental impacts, particularly flooding and understandably so. Mm -hmm. But I'm wondering what thought you've given to other environmental impacts associated with the project. In particular, uh, have you looked at lead uh, um, 
standards for what kind of design you would want the building to achieve in terms of uh, uh, energy efficiency. Have you thought about solar panels? Uh, you know, the, it would seem to be an attractive element to have to your project if it had a lower net carbon score than your typical development. So I'm just wondering if you and your team have thought about those kinds of things, either in the construction phase or for the actual finished product and the operation of the building. Yes, uh, we certainly have, and we agree. Those are exciting features that we will build into the detailed design. Uh, um, several members of the design team, myself included, are lead AP uh, certified, and we also have a lot of experience with uh, on-site uh, uh, clean energy generation uh, and other techniques. So we intend to build high efficiency buildings. Uh, you know, there are several codes. LEED is one of them. It's an excellent one, uh, but there are other performance codes. So we're, we haven't arrived at, uh, you know, what codes we're gonna uh, target, but we certainly have a sustainability program for our detailed plan. And it will include both efficiency uh, and um, carbon reduction and uh, potential on-site generation. We don't have a ton of room to do solar panels like you know some other projects, but there those aren't the only alternatives uh, in terms of, um, of of clean power. So we're, we're going to explore all of them. But to do that, as I said, sort of returning the the, the initial step in getting to the detail plans and and the expenditure of those design uh, fees is to get uh, a zoning. Uh, approval that allows you the use, and then you go into detailed plan. But, but uh, Alder Marshawn, absolutely part of our program is to be a uh, high efficiency, uh, um, uh, high performance building. Um, I just don't know. I can't tell you today which code. Thank you, Attorney Rinelli. You, you, you should expect to hear more about this at the detailed site plan phase, since I serve on that commission. Yeah. But that is it for me for now, Mr. Chair. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Thank you, Alder. Um, I had Alder Douglas next, but uh, he put his hand down. Do you still want to? Uh, uh, yeah, just a quick sure. question. Yeah. So, uh, Mr. Rinelli, um, I, I may have missed it. Is there a piece, a, a commercial piece to this uh, project? Yes. Are they going to have, okay, can, what's, how much space is it going, going to occupy? I believe it's and, approximately 11,000 square feet. Uh, Brian, is that right? Yeah. Uh, and it's, it's really the prime real estate. If you went down there and said, boy, where could I put my windows? It's going to be the first floor looking uh, southwest over the whole area. So that area is going to be double high ceilings. So up to the second floor. So, you know, very lofty feel inside and uh, a lot of windows facing out, enjoying the, the, you know, the view and the sunsets. And uh, it's about eleven thousand square feet. All right, and and who who are you looking to attract to uh, <laughs> occupy those spaces? Well, we can't really we haven't we haven't <laughs> gone looking. We can't really uh, attract someone because they don't look that far out. We need to get over the zoning uh, approval before we can really go to market uh, mm -hmm. because they're looking for smaller windows in which they can build out their need, you know, most, most retail sales, smaller windows to build out their needs, uh, time windows that is. Um, and so we need to get past this uh, part, of, part of the process before we can attract uh, residents. All right, thank you. And just a comment, um, someone mentioned earlier that the Maritime Center now is kind of open to the public I don't get that sense. I don't get the sense that it's kind of open. I've gone down there quite a few times just to stroll and bike once in a while. And it just seemed like it was gated off, just closed off. I hope that changes. That's it. Thank you. Excuse me, Alder. I, I, I would like to know if that ever happens to you. I want you like you to know because there are no gates and you're free. And many times there's fishermen in the evening, in the warmer months, and that come down. And I know it, it's never, for whatever reason, you are correct that it's never brought a lot of people down, but that's not in any way our fault. We, we welcome people to come down and fish and bike as, as much as they wish. 
Yeah, no, I, I'm not saying that it's your fault or anything. It just doesn't seem like it's welcoming. Uh, if I, if if I'm saying putting it right, yeah. Um, well, well, just, part of that may may be that it's by itself down there, and that's the goal. Yeah. The plan is to get more energy down there, more people on the street. Now that's right, a I'll silver like... that's a silver tongued lawyer talking. <laughs> I'm going to keep you to your word, Lynn. I'll be calling you. You, you come down. There's no gates I'm, here. I will. All right. Thank you. Alder Douglas. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, I have Alder Rodriguez, who will be followed by Alder Decola. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I know that, um, where's Matt? You mentioned um, the commercial. Obviously, you can't tell us what's going to be there um, right now. You're in the starting phases. One of the things I would recommend is that you connect um, with the economic development folks and find out how the um, stores and the restaurants are doing downtown. I can tell you it is difficult when we go downtown to um, have dinner, a lot of the, the um, parking lots are full, but what I have found, and again, you mentioned the cafe, you mentioned the market and um, future shopping there, which sounds great. I would recommend that you check to see if someone spends a certain amount of money at one of the cafes and the stores that there would be a um, discount for those who are parking in the parking lot, how they do downtown. I think they do that to be able to attract more people. Um, my hopes is that, you know, we definitely want to, um, if this comes to fruition, that we, you know, we get some, some foot traffic and also obviously people are going to need to park in the parking lots. And so, you know, uh, uh, give and take and that if I spend, um, money's eating or shopping that, you know, we'd have a little bit of a um, validation. So that way you can generate the foot traffic that is much needed down there. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Understood. Thank you, Alder Rodriguez. Um, I have Alder Nicola next. And I'd also uh, like to recognize um, Alder President Taisha Walker Myers, um, who has joined us. Um, welcome, Adam. Alder Nicola. Thank you. Uh, Chair, uh, yeah, uh, uh, most of my questions were asked by some of my colleagues. My question will be to when you start this project and, and I'm, I'm really enjoying the, what's the future will be there. Are we planning to build both buildings at the same time or the commercial one first and then the, the apartments? I was just curious, what's your, what would be your steps here going forward on construction if everything is uh, met to the city's needs and the state and everything else. Yeah, so, I mean, this may get refined at a uh, detailed site plan, but what we submitted with our application was a uh, phasing plan that shows we're gonna build, we wanna build building one first, and then ideally we will immediately build building two without having to, uh, you know, reassemble and redeploy everything. But the reality is with building, some of that will depend on the market uptake uh, of, of, of building one. So we, we did submit a phasing plan to start with building uh, one. And if they're, you know, in terms of financial efficiency, best scenario is we go right to building two. If we, under our plan, if we do pause the footprint area for building in our plan, we show the footprint area for building two will be, uh, you know, uh, uh, appropriately landscaped until building two is built. So in other words, you'll have more open space uh, until that time. But, but you know, we just submitted the phasing plan because that's always a uh, possibility. Okay, so building one is the one with the apartments, not the retail, correct? Uh, no, building one is, they both have apartments. So building one is the one closest to the boathouse, closest to the edge there. It's the, it has okay. the you're correct, it has the market. And then okay. above the market. I, I, Oh, okay. That's what I was just concerned, which one you were going first. Yeah. And, and, and basically, and if you see my picture over my left shoulder, that's what it used to look like in 1945. Yeah. <laughs> so there, there's a picture for you. So you see the development that New Haven has done in the year, decades. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Alder. Um, 
I see Alder Kupo has another question. And after that, I think um, uh, we will move on to the city staff. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I have uh, two questions. Just the first one was, how? what do you believe is the lifespan of these buildings? Uh, I'm gonna defer to uh, Lynn on that. What is the lifespan of a building like this? Certainly over 50 years. Okay. Um, and I have a question just in relation to your storm preparedness plan. Um, so it says, Oh, um, I have a question regarding the storm preparedness plan. Yes. So um, it says that um, they'll have to initiate evacuations if the water level rises to 11 feet above low tide. Um, first, I wanted to ask, have you done studies um, to see how often that would happen over the course of the next 50 years? Well, uh, there are studies. We didn't have to redo them. I mean, FEMA has done them. And so that that level is the what they call the 100 year storm. Uh, it's not a guarantee that it only happens every 100 years, but it's a, it's a percentage frequency. Um, so the typical storms uh, don't rise to that level. So it is, uh, we characterize as um, infrequent, but, in but when it occurs, we'll have to activate that communication plan. So all of that, you know, we relied on the FEMA data plus the Connecticut specific sea level rise data. We didn't do our own studies. How often in the last 10 years has that happened? I think uh, it probably has, if you get 10 years, you're probably talking Irene, I think was 2011 or 12. That's probably the last time, uh, but Lynn, correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> I'm much older than you, Matt. I can't remember, but I, <laughs> oh, I, I would say the same. Yeah, so, so Irene, I think was, the, if I have my storms right, uh, was, was the last time. And that, what happened there was, um, as we told City Plan Commission, there was water on Long Wharf. Uh, it did come up over that elevation. It did not enter, for example, Maritime Center, which is at uh, 12 feet elevation. It did not enter that building. Uh, but the water was was up around that area. You know, it sort of comes in at the low point by Canal Dock, and it comes in actually at the low point by the tanks. It actually doesn't come in on the parcel at issue. It comes in at those two corners and then infills uh, because those are the two low points. Um, but and prior to that, I, I, I probably think prior to that, it, it may have been a very long time uh, prior to 10 years ago. It, it did not come into Lenny and Joe's either. Right. But it, but you can see in old photos, it, it does come up into that area. So, so I, I, and uh, Alder Kupo, just so you know, so our plan, and we think this is in keeping with strategic thinking about, about managing sea level rise, to, and this is what the building code says, is don't armor the shoreline, don't keep it out, build to allow it and those infrequent events to wash through and then drain because this, it's not sustained flooding. It's only for the storm event. We're not like a floodplain of a river where you continue to have water coming down. This is water driven by a storm event and then it recedes out. So that's why we have nothing on the lower level, nothing below 15 feet. Thank you, um, Attorney Rinelli. Last question. Um, so given all of what you've just said, uh, right, I think one thing that I would like to understand a little bit more that I did not find in the um, in the entire document was just what I know. What exactly is the um, the plan uh, for evacuation in the event that a storm like this were to occur? Um, you know, what is the plan for evacuation? Where will people go? Um, can you talk a little bit about about that? I can conceptually, but. The answer is, you know, it, again, once we pass this stage, we would engage in, in, in coordination with the city emergency preparedness uh, f folks. Um, but the, the general plan is, you know, as I said, we have this communication plan, which I think you're going to start to see become sort of a standard. And then in terms of if, if there were a need to evacuate people, and again, there may not be because remember our first residential resident is at 26 feet elevation. So no, no residential 
uh, units are going to experience flooding in any storm that wouldn't present, wouldn't put the highway underwater. Um, but if there is a need to evacuate them, we would do that through the similar uh, coordination with city emergency preparedness to uh, house them in either uh, we do now in uh, certain schools uh, are set up as facilities for the storm event. So people who wanted to evacuate would, would go to those shelters that are currently being set up and people who um, others could go, you know, friends, relatives. I mean, the things that residents do now, uh, but we would obviously work with the city on the next, at the next phase to really detail those plans out. But we, we think we have a good start with this internal communications plan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, that's all for me. Thank you, Alder Kupo. Um, I think now would be a good time because uh, that might have been a good transition to bring in um, city staff. Um, I, uh, as 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 we do that, um, I just want to remind um, my colleagues on this committee. Um, you know, when we're in a hearing, we should not be addressing applicants or staff um, by their first names. Um, I think that's, it's, it's important. Um, I think that we should, you know, not do that. So, um, with that, and I would also urge folks, um, as city staff join us here to make sure that, uh, you know, certainly ask as many questions as you need to, because this is a big, important project, but let's do make sure that they're pertinent to the underlying zoning, um, which is the issue that is, uh, in front of us this evening. Um, so, Mr. Lucas. Yep, who are we bringing in? Uh, I see Carlos has his hand up. Um, I would like to hear from, um, from Engineer Zinn, certainly, um, and City Plan Director Woods. Gotcha, yep, City Plan, okay. Let's bring him in. Uh, Mr. Chair, this is a point of order. Whoever is not speaking may want to put themselves on mute. All right, welcome everyone. This, this room has gotten even more unwieldy, um, but we'll keep order as best we can. Um, I'm not sure if someone from the city um, would like to give a little bit of the city's perspective. Um, and I know that colleagues will, will have questions, um, but I will, I'll turn it over to, uh, to the administration team. Um, thank you, um, uh, Chairman De uh, Decker, and thank you, Board of Alders. This is Carlos Azaguirre with the City's Economic Development Administration. I reside at 244 McKinley Ave in New Haven. Um, and I just want to give, I won't, this has been a long meeting, so I won't stay on too long. I just want to um, just talk a little bit about um, the, the importance of this project to the city staff in general, especially the folks on this call, um, not least of which is due to the involvement um, that, that the staff had in crafting and enacting the long work responsible growth plan. Um, we see this residential project, which the, which the zoning amendment would enable as a big um, component project to the whole plan in a solid first step in enacting the plan's vision. Um, we, you know, I think you've, see, you'll, you'll, you've seen a high coastal area manage, a, a high level of detail that, um, with regard to coastal area management. Um, I think we're pretty excited to have a type one building, you know, a high rise building, um, steel building that offers more density and a distinctive design. And I think speaking from an economic development perspective, you know, business perspective, an addition like this is very important to the Long Wharf Business District. Uh, we had our first virtual meeting with the business district that we do semi-annually uh, in person. Usually we had the first one in a while since last June yesterday. And um, uh, the Fusco team came on and spoke about the project. And there's just a high level of excitement for folks like Ikea and um, Jordan's and, and um, uh, food terminal, the, the theater, they all will really, this will really benefit. We think, you know, having this many new residents, this much excitement, Along with the hotel, hotel Marcel, um, is it's 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 a really big deal for the for the for the business community. Um, 
And I just would add also that FUSC with, with regard to the long responsible growth plan, which uh, Mr. Zinn, Mr. Piscatelli and Ms. Woods all worked uh, very you know, closely on for several years. Um, the FUSCO's design team, long before this project was um, even coming towards fruition here, uh, has spent hours meeting with the um, long, long Rough Responsible Growth Plan design team um, to design a building that was really in concert with the Long Wharf Plan. So I think you're, again, you're seeing this is like the first real beachhead um, um, in Long Wharf as far as with residential, both residential and with uh, new construction that really uh, aligns with the plan. Um, so I, I just would also say that, you know, this really recognizes the moment um, in coastal, for coastal planning. And I think um, just bigger picture projects like this don't move forward. We risk a real pullback from the coastline uh, and you may begin to see a disinvestment in our waterfront. So I think um, despite the, the, the risks of, of, um, brought about by climate change, this is um, I, I think a responsible development that, that's worth um, supporting. Um, and so we think this project is a high level of resilience as, you, as uh, Attorney Rinelli and others told you, it's designed well above the flood zone um, and it has meaningful public access. So we really think that the project, this will spur further investment in the district, see the rest of the plan come to fruition. And um, uh, uh, we have our technical staff on, as you're aware, who can answer any technical questions that you may have. Um, but thank you for uh, letting me testify. Thank you, sir. Um, I see Alder Douglas. Um, I want to invite, uh, before we, we go to questions, I, I, I want to invite engineers in um, to speak a little bit more. Um, I, in particular, would like to hear more about your perspective, sir, on, on some of these uh, you know, potential flooding issues that, that have been brought up all evening. Sure. Uh my, again, Giovanni Zinn, city engineer. I reside at 95 Soundview Terrace uh, here in New Haven. Um, I, I thank you for inviting me here tonight. Uh, I, I think it's, a, a, as Carlo, uh, Mr. Ezegary said, uh, you know, this is a very interesting time for our waterfront, a time of a lot of potential, a time of a lot of uh, uh, risk, and a, and a lot of, and a time for a lot of planning um, and uh and deep thought on what the future of New Haven's relationship with its waterfront is. Uh, you know, as you have all said as a body in the climate emergency resolution, you talked about how uh, uh, climate change is really the, the issue of our time, uh, you know, certainly from an infra infrastructure perspective and, and also many other perspectives. Uh, and it's one that uh, is a big part of everything that we do. Um, I think, uh, you know, I take my hat off to uh, our city plan director and the responsible growth plan for having really done a lot of visioning around what uh, the future of Long Wharf looks like uh, in light of climate change. Um, there's no question, as many of you have known and have heard, that the city will require a lot of investment in all parts of the city along its coast to deal with climate change. We are starting to make those investments. Uh, you've seen projects in the Cove. Um, you know, we're doing uh, living shoreline projects on both sides of the harbor. Uh, we've talked also about our Army Corps project that the Army Corps is looking at. Um, and the, the Responsible Growth Plan uh, provides a, a sustainable pathway for development such as the one that you see, uh, you know, that would be enabled by the zone change before you uh, to provide the uh, financial wherewithal and impetus to uh, look at our infrastructure and make sure that we're addressing these uh, uh, the, these concerns that we have. So specifically about the Harbor District um, uh, on, on Long Wharf, uh, I, I don't take issue with anything the developer said in terms of the sort of the raw numbers that they're talking about. Um, you know, if you look at the, uh, what we look at sea level rise, um, and there's a lot of different predictions, uh, you know, the official state of Connecticut, uh, prediction is, uh, um, 20 inches by 2050. Uh, you know, we certainly like to look out longer than that up to hundred years. Um, you know, you, a building like this, I think a 50 to hundred year lifespan is something that is, is definitely, uh, worth considering, um, you know, the having a first floor elevation of elevation 15 um, and I, I'm, the engineer in me always gets very agitated when people start talking about elevations because, well, it's elevation from what? Um, and 
Uh, all of these numbers are in what's called NAVD88, which is a, a datum, uh, basically a, a point uh, in space that the uh, that engineers and surveyors have set. Um, zero is kind of sort of around mid tide. Um, that's not defined by that necessarily, uh, but it is it is there. And so you know, high tide currently is uh, around three. A higher tide is about three point four. Um, I, I think you saw uh, mean high water right now is a little bit under elevation three. Um, you know, having an, an elevation NEVD 88 of 15 on the first floor is obviously a, a very strong um, uh, uh, place to put uh, the elevation of the building. Um, you know, even looking out at uh, the Army Corps predictions in 2116, um, uh, you, you're still looking at elevations in the 100 year flood event, uh, which has a 1% chance per year of, uh, of happening uh, that are, you know, over a foot below that. Um, uh, so there's, I, I think there's a lot of resiliency built into the, uh, plan itself for that particular development. Um, I think as we look at this, uh, district in general, the Harbor district, uh, you know, we're certainly looking at how we can look beyond this development and create a sustainable and resilient, uh, area of the city. Uh, it's a place that um, I, I think all of us would agree has a lot of potential. Uh, the responsible growth plan, uh, you know, I think half of the economic benefit uh, identified in the responsible growth plan happens in this harbor district, which is, you know, the, the part of uh, sort of between I-95, uh, Water Street, um, and, and Long Wharf Drive in the water, right? So that little pocket there has Tank Farm, you know, uh, uh, you know, the sports and then the frontier and then obviously the Fusco buildings. Um, so, uh, you know, looking at that, I think we want to look as a city and we're starting to examine what it would take to make, uh, to raise some of the roads in the area um, and to really provide for dry egress so that, um, you know, no matter what the flood elevations are in the next hundred years, we'd be able to get people in and out of there safely. Uh, get our emergency vehicles in and out and, and have uh, egress and access to the area that's dry. Um, you know, and I think the opportunity here uh, with development and with the zoning that's before you uh, provides uh, something, you know, improves the economics of that sort of investment for us. So with that, I'm happy to take any questions you may have specifically about it. All right, thank you, um, Mr. Zinn. Um, I will ask uh, if directors Woods um, or Piscatelli have anything to add, um, and then uh, we will open it up to colleagues. Hi, this is um, Aisha Woods. Um, I reside at 42 Canner Street in New Haven. Um, I just, uh, I wanted to say, I think um, both, uh, our deputy director, um, is it Gary and our city engineer Zinn covered, um, you know, covered the, the economics and the resiliency. Um, I just wanna say, I think uh, this project is really a benchmark that we can use when we think about updating the zoning for the rest of the district and really setting a high bar in terms of expectations um, around future development um, in the Long Wharf District. So um, I, I just wanted to uh, make that comment and um, I'm happy to take any questions that are specific to the um, city plan approval as well. Ms. Gip pardon me, Mr. Piscatelli, anything to add? Oh, well, good evening, Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the commission. Um, thank you for your time tonight. My name is Michael Piscatelli. I'm the Economic Development Administrator for the city, and I reside at 353 Summit Street in New Haven. As stated, just in the interest of time um, and to support your record, uh, you'll have the City Plan Commission Advisory Report and the entire docket as part of your record for review. Um, as discussed tonight, this is a very thorough set of general plans. And then many of the detailed questions that you heard tonight will also follow on um, should you approve it and the zoning is in place for the detailed plan review, which would go to the City Plan Commission. 
And with that in mind, I, I did want to make sure that the record was clear on a couple of points. One is as part of your approvals and as part of our responsibility under the Coastal Area Management Act, um, consistent with what Attorney Ranelli said, there will be a firm anchoring of public access, um, much like it is today. I feel like, I mean, this is a hidden gem. I've done there all the time and it's such a nice part of the city. It's a beautiful bit of public um, accessible walkway and it will be that way in the future. And um, if it's an easement, if it's a series of conditions, regardless, <laughs> there will be very firm coastal area max access protection such that that access is there for the entire public. And I had heard that earlier on the call. And then second, I think it, it's important just given the lens of coastal resiliency and hazard protection and mitigation, um, you know, we, we bring to you through the hazard mitigation process, the entire program. We have 1,750 buildings within the special flood hazard area of the city. So in, you know, in some respects, as we talk about the precedent and, um, and, and going forward with a project like this, it, it is truly setting that benchmark for how we deal with what it will be an extensive set of, uh, of issues and challenges citywide. And even with the, the flood uh, elevation and the base floor set at 15, it is quite likely that in an emergency condition like we saw with Irene, it is an evacuation order, right? So even though the units are upstairs and they're safe and this building will be well protected, the surge will come in, it will go out. Um, there is an evacuation scenario there, right? And that's why it was very important for the applicants to put together um, the section in tab 12 to set forth how that would go forward. And it sets a model for us citywide, recognizing that your general plan approval should it go forward here, lead to the detail plans. And now that last step, which is emergency operations as well in the, you know, the uh, atypical circumstances when we are dealing with you know, excess flooding in the neighborhood, particularly on Long Wharf Drive. So with that, I'll, uh, I'll turn it back. If you have any questions for staff, and then I know you have some public on the call as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I see uh, my co-chair Alder Wingate has his hand up, um, so I will yield to him. Thank you, Chair. Um, I have a question in reference to the public, um, um, I guess, how can I say the, the public opportunity, the public space? Have there been any conversation around um, putting together an MOA in reference to um, the public space, the uses? Alder Wingate, if, uh, if that's a question for, for us or staff, I don't know, but we, we have not had any of those discussions, a memorandum of agreement sort of a, of how it would operate. Um, I think that would, if that's something uh, that the city wanted to discuss, we would do it as part of the detailed plan process because we don't have anything to discuss yet. But, um, but, but I, I think that's what you're referring to is sort of a mutual understanding mm -hmm. of, of how it would operate. Uh, you know, yes. I, yeah, I, I, we have not had that discussion. We can certainly have it in the future. Um, and I would just also point to the level of maintenance and upkeep at the Maritime Center. I mean, uh, that, you know, you, I understand the desire to, to make sure it looks great, but I would say, you know, you've you got a good example that the Maritime Center is, is manicured and well-maintained and we have every incentive to do the same for this project because we need to attract residents and guests and uh, to, to that area. So uh, we can certainly have that conversation with the city uh, if we should be approved. Thank you um, to the city staff that will be dealing with that. Um, I, as a suggestion, I think you should look into it. It, um, and the, it often, um, typically when we have a project that has a, um, coastal site plan application to that, um, we, we deal with those issues at the detailed um, plan level. So when, so when they come back for a detailed plan, there'll be opportunities to, you know, set some conditions around the coastal access part. Thank you so much, city plan director. Thank you, chair. Thank you, Alder Wingate. Um, I saw Alder Douglas, your hand is going up and down, but uh, if you'd like, you're, you're on the queue if, you, if, if you'd like to be. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a quick question. What's the what's the height of the tallest structure that will be uh, implemented? If uh, anybody can answer that. How many floors? What how high is these buildings going up? Brian, could you give the the maximum height? I think we have a we're building up 13 and a building of 15 stories. So uh, but I don't know that the height yeah. number. Yeah, I, I think the answer to that question is going to have have a lot to do with um, where, where we end up with the flood elevations. But I think as it sits right now uh, in the current planning, we're, we're probably at about 175 feet. So, so you're talking like 13, 12, 13 stories? Uh, yeah, oh. that's go ahead, Matt. Yeah, we're, we're right now envisioning 13 stories in one building and 15 in the other. So the highest point would be of, of our general plan is 15 stories. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Alder Douglas. Thank you, Alder Douglas. Um, other questions from colleagues? Alder C. Rodriguez. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This, this um, is more a comment for Mr. Piscatelli. Um, we have an open um, walking area over at the condos, the Harbor Close and now um, the other two that are there. How was that put into place with the city? Perhaps that is a conversation that um, you can have with Mr. Rinaldi in regards to ensuring that it's definitely a um, public access. I know that you guys have said that throughout the night. Unfortunately, over at the condos area, we had one resident who was pushing um, very hard on, it wasn't even the city, it was one particular gentleman who wanted that not to be a public um, amenity for those of us who live in the area. So I know that that's important. It's important to the rest of us that actually walk down to Long Wharf. Um, and do use the back where the daycare center is because it is open to the public. Um, so, you know, just ensuring that 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 um, verbiage is there so that we don't have, let's just say, um, a resident um, that confronts someone in the public walkway as we had again in over at the condos. Um, so that's that's just, you know, one thought so that we can ensure um, that that's clear. Alder Rodriguez, we can have that conversation and maybe even talk about signage or other sorts of uh, techniques. But um, you know, certainly that's our intent. And unlike uh, the area you're describing, we're going to have a commercial uh, enterprise there that we need people to come to. But 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 we understand that people want comfort that this is uh, going to maintain uh, be maintained the way we say it will. So we'll be happy to have those discussions with staff if we, as we move on to the next um, phase. I appreciate that. I again, I've used the the space in the back of the area where the de, uh, where the restaurant used to be, and and we've walked it. Um, but I just want um, you know the public and my colleagues also to be um, assured that you know. It's a walkable, usable space. Um, and we want to attract people to come down to the waterfront. So thank you for that, Mr. Rinaldi. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Alder. Alder Kupa. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, my question is uh, specifically for Engineer Zinn and Director Woods. Um, I first just want to thank um, Engineer Zinn for your, like, your thorough discussion earlier of why you're in favor of this project. Um, so I want to kind of quickly just speak briefly about so the letter from Director Brian Thompson from Land and Water Resources Division of DEEP. Um, I've looked over it quite a bit. Um, there are a lot of things in this letter that are of particular concern to me and seem, I mean, outright, he's, he says that we should deny this. Um, Engineer Zinn and Director Woods, I just want your, you know, what is it, um, you know, despite, despite what is in this letter, why still, um, or what are you weighing and what conclusion have you come to and what's led you there to why we should approve this project or approve this, um, this uh, zoning change? Uh, well, again, thank you, Alder Kupo, um, for uh, uh, 
you know, prompting us to talk about that specifically. I think it's very important to talk about. Um, I've known uh, Mr. Thompson for years now. He's someone that I've worked with closely at the state. I have a lot of respect for him. Um, and I have a lot of respect for the, the, the position of Connecticut DEP. Um, you know, I think there's, uh, I think this is something that they do in general whenever they see zoning that in, in their uh view uh, adds residential to uh, a flood zone um, or, or somehow uh, in their view again int intensifies the floodplain use that they they send out a letter uh, delineating the issues that um, you know you see in in there uh, the coastal management act specifically talks about and, and there's a section that he refers to uh, protecting life uh, we certainly share that goal protecting property Again, again, not quite as important as protecting life, but also very important. Um, and then also ensuring that we don't have to go back and spend a bunch of money uh, to protect these uh, developments, you know, 20, 30 years down the line. Again, a goal that we would share as well. Uh, you know, we want to make sure that when we look at all this stuff, we're planning for that horizon. So specifically, um, I, I, I don't think it's, uh, it's axiomatic or, or reflexive that Anytime you uh, you have residential it, it, on, in, a, in a floodplain, it, it's automatically less uh, safe uh, or it automatically puts life at risk. Uh, I think we've talked a lot about the elevations here. Um, you also have the city's responsible growth plan, uh, you know, the adopted plan of the city that talks about uh, the resilience that we are looking to build in this area. Um, I, I think also, uh, I, there's a you know philosophical question as well um, about how cities interact with their waterfront. Uh, you know, New Haven has a very built-up waterfront. I think in our discussions with the state, they've made it very clear that they don't have a concern about this uh, disrupting uh, sort of natural or habitat uh, type of resources. Um, it really is a an engineering question at the end of the day. How do we make sure that people's lives aren't put in danger? Um, and I think the type of construction, uh, the elevation of the construction, uh, you know, coupled with the plans that we have uh, in responsible growth to look at the entire district, um, you know, I think together all of those things uh, provide a, a pathway to have a, uh, uh, you know, a successful zone change in this area to residential. You know, that being said, a lot of the devils are still in the details, right? That's why we have detailed site plan review. That's why, um, you know, I, I'm sure the Fusco team knows very well that I have plenty of questions that I'm going to ask uh, as the city engineer and things I'm, we're, we're going to ask for uh, as we get to detailed site uh, plan review. Um, the, uh, you know, certainly building code um, and also the regulations of FEMA provide pathways to make uh, uh, the Harbor District, uh, you know, safe. Uh, and a place that we can use to, we can develop and create opportunities for New Haveners. I mean, we, one of the things that strikes me sort of most philosophically is the fact that we live at the intersection of I-91 and 95. We have the rail yard. Um, we live with the, with the environmental burdens of these uh, large uh, transportation corridors. Um, and, and I think it's, uh, we shouldn't shy away from being creative to find ways to also take advantage of them to provide opportunities and economic growth for New Haven based on those, uh, those assets there. And I think, uh, you know, as, as uh, you know, Fusco talked about and as the Responsible Growth Plan talks about, uh, you know, having those, uh, these sort of transit-oriented developments near our transportation corridors is really a competitive advantage for New Haven. Great. Um, this is Aisha Woods. Um, I reside at 42 Canner Street. I think um, <clears throat> Engineer Zen covered covered quite a bit there. Um, I would just uh, I would just add um, the you know the the specific objection um, in in that letter was as Engineer Zen pointed out very specifically to this intensification of use in a flood zone. Um, but in the urban context, it's really, um, you know, we really need to look at how we want to develop with water. And I think this project really takes a live with water approach. It doesn't deny that there's going to be climate change or that there are risks involved, but it takes a number of measures to reduce those risks. The alternate, if we go with, um, 
you know, not allowing any intensification of use, whether it's residential or otherwise in the waterfront, um, you know, we'll end up having to abandon areas like Long Wharf, Mill River, um, you know, and, and we'll, DEEP allows uh, uses such as water dependent uses that are industrial, such as the big salt piles that you see and other um, uses that really create a burden on some of our New Haven um, neighborhoods. So the options, um, we just really wanna, um, be front and center in um, reimagining or or making the future use of our waterfront in the very best interest for our residents who live in New Haven um, and not, you know, sort of abandon our waterfront as a viable um, area of enjoyment of residential use of economic development. So um, I think, you know, this project is a benchmark for that. I think there's lots of um, opportunities really to reimagine our land use plan um, throughout our coastal zones. And um, we really need to do that and really, um, you know, take an, uh, a, a very um, like city's first approach. We, we don't have the option of moving up, of all migrating up to Woodbridge. We are gonna stay in New Haven where we are and um, really make the best use of our waterfront. So, um, so that's just what I would add to um, to sort of, I think our our heartfelt position on this. So it's again, we agree with DEEP on, on um, all of their concerns. We feel that this particular project does the risk reduction that's really critical for any project in a, you know, where there is flood risk. And, um, but we really wanna continue this dialogue with our state partners about how the conditions in New Haven are very unique and specific and different than the conditions that might be very applicable, you know, in some of our shoreline communities where it's single family houses, um, rather than a dense built up urban edge. Um, so uh, I'm happy to answer any other questions. Thank you both. Um, that's all for me, Mr. Chair, thank you. Thank you, Alder. Um, further questions for city staff before we um, ask for public comment? Seeing none, um, if folks could stick around, we may have some final questions after public testimony, um, but we thank you for the very thorough uh, presentation and um, question answering. With that, I will ask if there's any member of the public here who wishes to be heard on this item. If you're in the attendees list and you wish to be heard, please raise your virtual hand um, and Mr. Lucas will bring you in one at a time. Any member of the public who wishes to be heard on this item? I see names in the attendees list, but I, I, I don't see uh, hands going up. Um, Mr. Lucas, is it possible to, to maybe blast them a message or something just to, in case they are there and wanna be heard on this item? I think you did that. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, no, I think you're good. I don't see. Any uh, urgent request to speak? I think you're good, sir. Very good. Um, I, make I will note for the record that uh, this committee received testimony um, from a couple of folks. Let me just um, pull up my messages to make sure I'm not missing anyone. Um, we received correspondence from um, Mr. David Anderson, who is the land campaigns manager for Save the Sound. Um, who wrote a letter in opposition to approval of this uh, zoning ordinance text amendment, which will be um, which uh, will be added to the record. And we received testimony, written testimony from okay Hollis Martins. 
Now we have it's a hand. Okay. It's Let me just, I was, I was finished saying we received testimony from Hollis A. Martins, um, who is uh, writing in support of this item as executive director of the Canal Dock Boathouse. Um, so those are the two written testimonies that uh, that I have seen that this committee has received, um, which will be added to the record. But it seems like we have a member of the public. So uh, if we want to bring bring that person on in. Okay. Uh, let's see. If you wish to speak, you are unmuted. You can speak now if you wish. Uh, are you, am I there? Yes. You are. Okay. Please, please give us your name and address for the record. My name is Fereshte Bekrad, and I live on 776 Konepiak Avenue and work on 195 Front Street, both sides of beautiful pictures, Konepiak River. I want to share with you as an architect, urban designer, planner, a developer, the importance of if effect of responsible waterfront development to New Haven. New Haven is fortunate to have an extensive shoreline that can allow development of mixed use recre recreational living waterfront. With careful plan, carefully planning component, such development can minimize certain inherent negative elements. People travel far to be and um, enjoy part of waterfront and the shoreline. New Haven waterfront can be a destination creating existing recreation, not urban design, urban living, with mixed use component and cause more physical, economic, and environmental revitalization to its surrounding and to, to the city. What this proposed development concept brings to its surrounding. This location is the gateway and introduction to New Haven from major regional thoroughfare. In addition to proposed projects location will be a catalyst and expediter to development of Long Wharf and its neighborhood. This mixed use residential concept encourages and develops a safe, continuous, Live, live activities in the surrounding at all hours, which creates positive vision and invites public participation. I am thrilled to have seen something that for many years I have looked and I thought was missed in New Haven, is coming to livelihood. We have a tremendous amount of waterfront. We cannot deny it. We cannot ignore it. It has its own difficulties and making it happen. But it is a tremendous asset. And we should not just uh, set it aside because of some things that are the nature of the beast of living in an urban environment on the waterfront. And I think we can all come together to solve it. I appreciate you letting me uh, talk to you about that because I am absolutely thrilled to be part of the Quinnipiac River development. And I really uh, welcome any development on the waterfront. If you have any questions. Thank you so much for your testimony. Um, do any members of this committee have any questions? 
Seeing none, um, thank you again for logging on. Um, and are there any other members of the public who wish to be heard on this item? A second time, are there any other members of the public who wish to be heard on this item? And again, uh, those two testimonies that were sent in that I mentioned will be added to the record. A third and final call, any members of the public who wish to be heard on this item? And Make seeing none, all I engage. I make a motion that we close the public portion at this time. Second. There's been a motion which has been seconded to close the public portion. Any discussion? Mr. Seeing Chair, none, we'll vote. Alder. Oh, Alder Marchand. Mr. Chair, this is Alder Adam Marchand. I just want to remind us that once we close the public portion, we're not going to talk to the staff or the applicant also, but go straight to deliberations. So if anybody uh, has any final questions, they should speak now and maybe the motion can be withdrawn. But if there are no further questions for city staff or the applicants, is there any further discussion on the motion which is on the table to close the public portion? Seeing none, we will vote and I will call the roll um, in the manner that I said at the beginning of this meeting. So uh, Alder Wingate. Yes. Alder Furlow. I see Alder Furlow saying yes, he's on mute. Yes. There he goes. Um, Alder Douglas. Yes. Alder Brackeen. We have lost Alder Brackeen. Alder Kupo. Yes. Alder Decola. Yes. Alder Edwards. Yes. Alder Farrar Santana. Yes. Alder Marchand. Yes. Alder Rodriguez. Absolutely yes. Uh, I say yes as well. The public portion of this meeting is closed. Thank you, everybody. I will entertain any further motions. Mr. Chair, this is Alder Adam Marchand. I move the Marchand. item. Second. Second. The item has been moved and has been seconded. Discussion. Mr. Chair, this is Alder Adam Marchand. Alder Marchand, proceed. I, um, I read in, in the staff memo something about a potential amendment. Is there are there recommended amendments that we should be entertaining at this time, Mr. Chair? Let me pull my staff memo back up if you'll give me a moment. Too many tabs. So staff recommended um, I have lost the page, pardon me. Alder Marchand, you don't happen to have it handy, do you? I am looking now, Mr. Chair. Yeah, a little computer trouble. Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. The, there were three potential amendments uh, listed in the staff memo. One, and I, if it pleases the chair, I'll just read them. So that we would can be decide great. whether or not to make them. So this is not a motion, it's just discussion. Yes, just discussion. Be it further ordered that the executed PDD documents and development agreement and any ancillary documents, whether concurrent with the execution of the agreement or contemplated at a future, at any future date, shall be filed with the Office of Legislative Services within seven days of execution with all revisions made after Board of Alders approval highlighted. That's one. Two, be it further ordered that the Board of Alders approvals of the PDD zoning ordinance text amendments and the cooperation agreement are conditional upon the project's current and future compliance with obtaining the cor correct building permits and other regulatory and legal requirements of the federal, state, and city governments. And three, 
be it further ordered that the conditions contained in the City Plan Ad Commission Advisory Report 1593-02 are hereby adopted by the Board of Alders Jesus. and incorporated herein by reference and thereby made mandatory for compliance by the petitioner and its agents. Those were the three that were recommended in our staff memo. Uh, thank you, Alder Marchand, for reading those uh, possible amendments for discussion. So just to remind folks, the item has been moved and seconded, and we are in discussion. So is there any further discussion on the item, including if somebody actually wanted to propose an amendment? I'm going to give colleagues a moment to mull those since I know that uh, they were just read to us. Mr. Chair, uh, my recommendation is that we ought to vet those potential amendments with the city staff. Um, uh, we, we, you know, we didn't have the foresight, I suppose, to ask them their opinion of it during the public portion, but there's nothing stopping uh, the full board from incorporating them, any or all of them, after we've had a chance to discuss them with city staff to, uh, and the maker to see if uh, they're amenable and if they achieve the goal of strengthening the approval and strengthening the approval in terms of, it, uh, of its being, um, uh, strengthening the, the board of alders uh, kind of stamp of, uh, of approval and strengthening our uh, jurisdiction over it. So that might, would be my recommendation is um, see this as a follow-up item between now and the second reading, should this committee vote on it tonight. Thank you, Alder Marchand. Um, I'm inclined to agree. I mean, as we all know, the purpose of going through this, this joint committee process is to vet the item, ask all the questions that we can you know, in, in our public duty. These potential amendments seem to me to be more about, if I understand them correctly, it seem to be more about compliance and more about, um, you know, they're, they're not exactly technical amendments, but they're technical-ish. They're not about um, changing the, um, you know, things uh, along the lines of our questioning this evening. So I would be inclined to agree, but uh, we're still in discussion. So if anybody disagrees, uh, they are more than welcome to, um, to do so or any other discussion. Alder Nicola. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, I'm in agreement with the discussion going on right now that that we can work on this to, to the next second reading. We have time to work with staff and I'm, I'm in agreement that that's the way we should go, in my opinion. And I think this project can be a catalyst for the whole world, Long Wharf area for the future of the city to be more of a area for living and, and for commercial use and a, a positive a revenue source for the red city too going forward. So um, I will be voting in favor of this tonight. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Alder Nicola. Um, further discussion, I call Alder Wingate. I echo everything that, um, thank you, Chair. I echo everything that Alder South Nicola just said. Um, I am, in favor of holding off on the amendments until we have more time to talk to the city staff as we go through the process um, and willing to hear what they have to say because we can do that on the floor. Um, <clears throat> so I'm inclined. Thank you, Alder Wingate. Further discussion on this item. I, I uh, Alder Marshawn. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I want to um, speak in favor of this item, uh, but I want to just note that some important issues have come up in the meeting tonight. Uh, I think uh, uh, I think it was Alder Kupo who mentioned the issue of affordability, and we heard the applicant say that that was a conversation that his team was going to have with the city staff. And I think it's appropriate for us as a body to 
reiterate on multiple occasions that the issue of affordability is important to us and to the city. <clears throat> and so we appreciate that those conversations will happen. And we look forward to hearing the fruits of those conversations. I also think that the questions about the fact that this project is right next to the shore and will likely experience some level of flooding over the next, over the life of the lifespan of these buildings. I think the questions about is this the right thing to do in a time of climate change and global sea rise? I think that's been a very good discussion. I appreciated the answer that our uh, answers that our city plan director and our engineer gave. Um, and I think that the question of the, the, the property management company having a really good evacuation plan. Now they've got a good outline and they've created up, they've kind of uh, mocked up some documents that they would propose to use to like put in paper down in black and white what, what they would do in different scenarios. But that's one thing. The other thing is to actually do it and to have people in place who can execute those plans. And so I think it's probably a good precedent for this board to uh, be asking uh, property developers and property management companies to develop really robust plans uh, around evacuations and different protocols that they would enact when we know that bad weather's coming and we're anticipating uh, water fl overflowing the shore and, and into the city. So uh, I think good follow-up is going to be very important. And one place where that will happen will be at the City Plan Commission, but also with the building department and with city staff going forward. So, you know, um, these are really crucial issues. But from my perspective, having people living down there actually will activate that area tremendously. I, I'm sure all of our all of colleagues have, have been down there at some time or another. Uh, it's not far from the food truck heaven. It's not far from the canal boat house. It's right next to those, the first ever contra flow bike lane in the city. I've been down there many, many times and just having more people down there, I think would fundamentally change the character of that area and for the better. Now there may be headaches around parking and traffic. When you have more people around, it's gonna be more vehicles and more people on foot than in, the, in their bikes or whatever. But I think this is a city <laughs> and having more people around is kind of part of the vision that we've been pursuing uh, through our zoning and our economic development policy for the last, well, if, at least for the last 10 years that I've been on the Board of Alders. So I think fostering uh, econ uh, economic development, of course, but fostering residential development along the shore is really exciting, really um, could be positive for the neighborhood for sure, but we need to make sure that it's executed very well so that the public safety issues around flooding are, are dealt with so that the, the, the building management company in the city well coordinated so that those, if there are evacuations that are required that they can be done expeditiously and safely and with the least amount of cost as possible. So um, have, with those concerns that I've put on the table and that others have discussed, uh, I remain convinced that this is the right thing for us to do. And so I'm encouraging colleagues to vote yes on a favorable recommendation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Alder Marchand. Um, Alder Kubo. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I agree uh, quite a bit with what my colleague from the 25th Ward, um, Alder Marchand, just said. Um, I regret However, uh, right after the possible amendments were read, my connection uh, dropped and I just wanted to know, um, did we come up with a plan about a possible amendment? Um, to catch you up, uh, so we're still in discussion. So nobody has proposed any of the amendments that Alder Marchand read. Um, Alder Marchand's suggestion, which Alder Decola and myself uh, also spoke in favor of was that we would have time to do that before the second reading because they're technical-ish amendments. Um, they're not amendments that really change the core of, um, of what is uh, trying to be accomplished. It's just more about compliance. So that's, that's where we're at on those. But again, we're still in discussion. So should anyone want to propose amendments, um, they still may. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I would be in agreement um, with both you and Alder Jacola regarding um, the need for a potential for um, one of these three technical amendments and would be in support of, sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Alder Kupo. Uh, Alder, when I get your hand is, is, is back up. Nope, it's still, still just hanging there. Got it. Further discussion, Alder Rodriguez. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I agree with all three of my colleagues. I think that one of the things that was mentioned is speaking to city staff as well to get more um, information in regards to the um, possible amendments um, that have been brought forth. I also want to encourage um, my colleagues that we not just push this developer on um, affordability, but to push on all developers for affordability um, for our residents um, to be able to live in, in the areas, um, in all areas of the city that, that are being built. Um, this area absolutely needs a refresh. I think that like my colleague, Alder Marchand said, it, it is busy there. We have a lot of foot traffic. We have a lot of car traffic, but I think that um, I am in favor of this project uh, moving forward and safely and, and ensuring that they too connect with the um, um, Director Fontana in regards to in the event of a storm and that folks needed need to be evacuated that we work with city staff to get folks like the residents over on South Water and in in the city um, point area um, to ensure that we all get to higher ground. Many times our residents want to stay home um, as previously. Um, we had we had that situation and we went door to door and many folks wanted to stay in their homes they put sandbags out so hopefully uh, moving forward they they actually heed the warning and move to higher ground with the assistance of director fontana i ask everyone um to think about the area this area needs some absolutely positive growth so that the hill grows and in in that long wharf growth project um moves forward so so um, again, definitely speaking to city staff and ensuring safety for all and growing the project um, successfully and healthy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Alder. Um, any further discussion on this item? Uh, Alder Marchand. Mr. Chair, I, I neglected to mention earlier, and I think perhaps somebody said it, uh, during deliberations, but there there was mention made of strengthening the language of the resolution somehow to give greater comfort and, and um, uh, confidence that public access to the shoreline would be maintained. And so we brought up the issue of an easement or uh, strengthening somehow the what the attorney referred to as the regulatory requirement. And so we, I don't have a particular mechanism at the moment to propose, but I think our staff heard loud and clear that this is an important issue to us. And so I would just think that perhaps a substantive amendment that might be developed between now and the second reading would be something along those lines. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Alder Marchand. Yes, I think that uh, members of this committee made made their desire for, you know, such a thing clear to the extent feasible. Any further discussion on the item before us? I see none, and so uh, we can vote and I will call the roll. Alder Wingate. Yes. Alder Furlow. Yes. Alder Douglas. Yes. Uh, we've lost for King and Alder Kubo. Yes. Alder DeCola. Yes. Alder Edwards. Yes. Alder Flora Santana. Alder Flora Santana. Yes, sorry, sorry about that. I couldn't get to my mic. Yes. Yes. Alder Marchand. Yes. 
Alder Rodriguez. Yes. Um, I vote yes as well. So the item carries favorably. Um, I will entertain any further motions. I make a motion we adjourn. Second. Second. Any discussion on adjournment? No. Seeing none, I will call the roll. Alder Wingate. Yes. Alder Furlow. Yes. Alder Douglas. Yes. Alder Coupo. Yes. Alder Decola. Yes. Alder Edwards. Yes. Alder Farah Santana. Yes. Alder Marshawn. Yes. Alder Rodriguez. Yes. I'm yes as well. We are adjourned. Thank you for uh, hanging in there, everyone. Good night, all. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair.